are we ready back there yet? There's still to be a few minutes. Okay, that's all right. Just give me a thumbs up when we're ready. Okay. Welcome to the Wanakee Community School District Board of Education regular meeting. Uh, the date is Monday, November 14th of 2016. We started at uh, 6.30 p.m., went into closed session for items appropriate for closed session. It is now 7.20 and we are back in open session. Uh, before we get started, I would like everyone to rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance in honor of our veterans. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, first of all, item six, approval of minutes. You have in your packet uh, minutes for the October 10th and October 24th special meeting uh, for review and approval. Approval of the minutes um, as submitted. Second. Moved by Julie, seconded by Joan. Any discussion, questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Uh, also, before we get started, uh, I'd like to announce we have some new videographers with us uh, this year, student videographers. Um, Garrett Stolen is back there right now, and then we will also be joined by Alex Tweed. And so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, but I have the opportunity to view these meetings online at a later date, we do have videographers that, that uh, take the meetings, and uh, often fortunate to have students who are, are playing that role for us. So, so welcome to, um, to the Board of Education meetings, Garrett. <coughs> Okay, are there any changes to the agenda? No, as written. Motion to approve of the agenda. So move. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Item eight. Uh, this is the item where individuals from the public may comment on any items on tonight's meeting agenda. Uh, I don't have any notes in front of me, but is there anybody out there who wishes to address the board? Okay, hearing none, you have the opportunity each month to do so. Thank you. Um, item nine, administrative reports, items, uh, starting with our students' reports, uh, Amanda and Michaela. Okay, um, so we haven't done that many events in student council since then, but since the last time we came here, but we will have a meeting on Wednesday to discuss some new activities, but for now, a couple weeks ago we did an open mic night where if any students wanted to come and share like a talent that they have like playing an instrument or singing and people can come to watch and it's like re it's really cool to see everyone come out and perform and see talents that we didn't know that other people had so it was a cool event a lot of people came out to see them and then just this past Monday there was a glow in the dark volleyball Don ball tournament mm -hmm. and you created your own team and it was really cool they had like all the lights set up and like all the balls would glow and they had like a huge um what's it called like bracket yeah yeah where the teams move on so it was like a huge competition and everyone competed it was raising money for cancer so that was really cool and then this past week on monday we went to a student council conference called the fall summit where we got to meet with other student councils like some prairie and other schools to see what kind of events that they do in their school. So we went had different like breakout sessions where we discussed like new things that we could have in our school. And one of the things that we mainly saw that could be a cool idea is during like our contact time, just having like a voice to talk to, and like from us like the students' perspe perspectives to talk to other students to see what they think of like different activities going on in school instead of having like teachers and stuff hear about it so we thought that maybe that would be a cool idea to share and then also we have a volleyball tournament coming up in the school and that's also like a dodgeball where you create your own team and um that might be donated to Isabel and I so everyone just made their volleyball team together and like the dodgeball you just all compete against each other and everyone like dresses up and has their own team theme and it's yeah, that's about it for 
Any questions? How much, how much are you raising when you do like your dodgeball with, with your student? Um, we, student council wasn't the like leader, like we just set up this event, we just like helped with it and a lot of the people participated in it. So I don't really know the outcome of that one. But I would say the um, volleyball team is usually 35 to 45 dollars per team that enters and usually you can donate more. So depending how many teams it is. We usually get a lot of teams. So yeah. we bring a good amount of money. Mm -hmm. that we Good. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? So there's gambling involved. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's called an entry fee. Right? <laughs> 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 it's a fundraiser. <laughs> oh, it always is. <laughs> it's Last month, excuse me, last month you talked about um, a blood drive. Have you set that up? No, we haven't set that up. I'm guessing we should be talking about that at the meeting we have Wednesday or after, because I think our first one's going to be December, so we haven't quite talked about that one yet. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. See you next month then. Item B, uh, board reports, starting with item one. Anybody has anything they would like to share with other board members on items, uh, either events they uh, or meetings they attended, things around the district or otherwise? Julie? I got to attend the staff PBIS training on October 27th. They met at um, the newly revised and renovated space at Heritage Elementary. There were um, teams of uh, staff and administration from each of the buildings represented and um, a person from CESA was uh, helping them to launch um, that behavioral support system consistently across our district and it just was really fun and exciting because it's another one of these areas where the ideas and how it's run and how it's to be implemented building to building, yes there's a framework to do it, but each building and, and uh, individual staff members were contributing for what they thought made sense for their building with their climate and their students and what was going on. So it, it gave a great overview. I was glad I had the time to be able to go and just sit and listen. It was great. Anybody else? Jack. Uh, I attended the uh, MADREP uh, board meeting in the Innovation Center with Randy um, this last Friday, I believe it was. And uh, they have board makeup of economic development, business people, uh, and WBC uh, members, and everybody was duly impressed with uh, what the team has done to <coughs> put the uh, Innovation Center together. And what was the reason they chose to have their meeting here, or what? Um, I think they were... They, they moved the meetings around, and I think that they had WEDC is launching their next round of Fab Lab grants. So which was, we got one last year. Which time. we received one last year, and they were familiar with our space and impressed with kind of how it came together. So they held the, this was their meeting that they just held in our space. So it was very nice. We had a chance to give them a, a tour and talk to them and interact with a number of folks. So real positive. Anybody else? Okay, and on to item number two, um, spring board election. Um, in your packets, uh, you'll see the notice of the spring uh, upcoming board election for April 2017. We have two members on the board whose terms are up, and um, it would be uh, Joan Ensign from Westport and Julie Weiner from Wanakee. Um, and um, basically, this announcement is that you, anybody else who may be interested in running for the Board of Education uh, for those seats, um, there's information available from the district office. Uh, you can circulate your papers starting December 1st, and the papers are due January 3rd, uh, and so for those of you who are interested in running the, the school board. And then also in the packet is a notification of non-candidacy for those individuals um, whose seats are up. If they choose not to run, they have until December 23rd to fill out a piece of paper saying, I choose not to run. Um, so that gives individuals at least a couple of weeks to um, possibly raise their hand and for the seats. Okay, on to item number C, strategic planning. Um, our, our first item on our strategic planning um, discussions tonight is a follow-up on the district wellness clinic recommendation. You've um, heard a, a few different updates over the course of the last number of months. The last one, I believe, in September. 
um, where you've asked for some additional information in some areas as far as the siting of the clinic and wanting us to really bring back information with regards to that um, along with our, our recommendation again. So that is what um, particularly um, Connie and Steve have been really heading up in our district. Um, Dr. Ranham, I thank you for being here. And um, I guess I'm going to turn it over to, to Steve and to Connie to um, really walk us through the, the presentation this evening and the recommendation at hand. All right, thank you, Randy. I'm going to uh, walk us through the presentation. Um, but at any point, uh, other members of the team that helped put this together, Dr. Annam, Hallie, Peter, Connie, Beth, would be more than happy to also address any questions or share any information that I, that I need to cover. I do have a, one quick question. Um, it's, um, this was presented to the Budget Committee, and then basically you're going to be looking for action to, um, for sources of funds and, and also possibly to implement this, right? Recommendation. Yes, our request is to seek approval tonight from the board to move forward with a trial wellness clinic that okay. would run from approximately January 2017 to June 2018. Okay, so this will be an action. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. So the items that we really would like to cover with you tonight is, first of all, where this connects to our strategic plan. The location options that we reviewed uh, as a team to get to where we are tonight for the recommendation. The services that would be offered in a wellness clinic. The costs that are involved. What the administrative recommendation is. And what the next steps would be if the school board uh, votes to approve for us to move forward with this. To start with. Uh, you've seen the district strategic planning document during these presentations before. Uh, we wanted just to reiterate where this topic connects in with the district strategic planning. It's under the human resources section of the plan. Um, there's a health clinic model uh, box or area of emphasis that we've been working on. Uh, for quite some time, <coughs> and that's how it connects into the overall district strategic plan. The objectives of what we were trying to accomplish when we set out to tackle this topic are listed here. Uh, I'm not going to read them, but basically, uh, at a fundamental level, we're looking to uh, create a value added benefit uh, to the district staff a no cost option that converts a fee for service, basically a fee uh, to our health care plan into a fixed cost. Uh, this type of model has been very successfully implemented in other parts of the state and in many private business settings, but it has not yet been implemented in this portion of the state uh, in a public school setting and we'll get into that when we move into the discussion. The partnership with Dean, we talked a little bit about this in previous month presentations, kind of how this has evolved uh, over a period of time. Recently, uh, there's been a significant emphasis on the wellness end of the health insurance program. Locations considered Connie, Al, and I uh, spent quite a bit of time looking through options out in the community, as well as we looked at some options inside the school district, which we'll go over in just a moment. When we looked out in the community, we decided to look at locations that were for sale. We looked at older locations. We looked at newer locations. Basically, anywhere that we thought that might be a fit for holding a clinic inside of that particular rental space we tried to take a look at. Uh, while we were looking at the locations identified here on the screen, we had a list of factors that were important for us to consider in each of these locations. <coughs> As an example, ADA accessibility. Whatever location we ended up selecting has to be available and accessible to those who are going to use it. Another item on here is image, curb appeal, access, location. Because this clinic would be a voluntary clinic, it needs to be in a location 
that staff feel comfortable going to. Uh, so we needed to look at a number of factors all identified on this screen in our search for what would be the most appropriate location to host a clinic of this site. We narrowed it down to a couple of choices internally and one choice out in the community. The choices internally were at the former intermediate school front office and the former intermediate school band room. We're labeling it that way because we thought it might be easier for you to visualize where it is. Uh, those are the spaces we looked at inside school facilities. And then we narrowed it down to the former Garden Terrace location at the Arboretum Center when we looked at community locations. For the intermediate school, the former intermediate school locations, we met with uh, Findorf and the principal of the school, as well as Connie and myself, to walk through the spaces to really make sure we were addressing the needs of that space. For the principal of the school, it was very important that if there was going to be a clinic hosted inside a school, that it needed to be what we were referring to as a building within a building concept, meaning the same safety and security measures we have in place for our students at all of our facilities would be in place at Heritage. So it was important to make sure that the clinic was not something that you just walked in an entrance up into the second stairwell and you could go anywhere throughout the school. That added cost. We wanted to make sure that there was only one location <coughs> in, one location out, and it was important for the principal that you could not leave the clinic, enter the school site, and be able to walk throughout the school. So looking at that approach, uh, the cost from Findorf, again, this is not a bid. This was a give us an idea of what it would take to meet those requirements in this space. For the front office was in the end approximately a little over than over $500,000. And in the back of the school, and this is what it would generally look like, so this was a diagram that we were working off of as to how we could convert that space into a clinic, a wellness clinic. In the back of the school, uh, there are more significant access issues to try to get in and out of the back of the school. And those issues would likely add about $300,000 to the cost of getting a space really accessible to those who would need to use it, as well as making sure you can only go in and out of one location in the back. Um, so the back of the school is quite a bit more difficult than it would be in the front. The community location that we honed in on for those of you who are familiar with the restaurant that was in place a few years ago called Garden Terrace, it's in the lower right-hand side of the picture is where the Garden Terrace restaurant was. Uh, in that location, to convert the space over to a wellness clinic would have an initial investment of about $70,000, uh, $25,000 for furniture and equipment, which would go with any of the proposals and then a lease cost of a little over $2,000 per month. The investment at this location would be about $131,000 for the 18 month trial period. This is the floor plan of what that space would actually look like upon completion. Uh, for those of you familiar with that space, um, you would know that there are some things that would need to be done to it to turn it from the restaurant location into a clinic location. One of the main advantages of this location, first of all, is the accessibility. There's an elevator in the building. There's also a ramp that already exists to, for people to go down the side of the building. Uh, the lighting is outstanding at that facility as well as just the overall curb appeal, it's a very nice location that would be very attractive for folks to go to, very convenient. So as far as the cost on the actual build out piece of building the clinic, uh, about 500,000 for the front of the former intermediate school space, about 800,000 in the back, 
and a little over $130,000 for the rental property. We've talked about this approach before. This approach really shows the wellness clinic at the center of what it is that we are trying to accomplish. Um, the wellness clinic being a dedicated 40 hour a week medical professional who has the ability to provide a number of services to um, the staff and their families of the district. Um, the expenses <coughs> of running a wellness clinic are identified on this slide. Um, a physician assistant or nurse practitioner would be posted upon school board approval. Um, the clinical director is Dr. Annam. Uh, dean would use their call center services for staff who would like to schedule appointments. Um, labs would be included in the wellness center. Equipment rental, data phone, miscellaneous, with a total of approximately $15,000 per month to run the wellness clinic or about $270,000 over the entire 18 month trial period. Uh, the targeted services really fall into two different types of categories. The first one you would see on the screen here. These are medical services that people would often go to maybe an urgent care if they needed to quickly get in and see a doctor or their own doctor at the clinic that they happen to go to on a regular basis. These are services that could be performed by a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant at the wellness clinic. So for the staff who would choose to go to this location, as opposed to like an urgent care, there would be no copay for the staff member on our health plan or their family to go and have these services medical services provided for them. Uh, the district's health plan would then not receive the charge for those services being performed because we are paying for them on a fixed cost basis. So all of those charges that used to go to an example the urgent care to our health plan would no longer do so. They would be converted over to a fixed cost. But the second major piece of what we'd be trying to accomplish is really overall health and wellness. Because this individual is there for 40 hours a week, they will be managing the care of many of the staff in the district who need additional assistance, whether it's diabetes or some other similar long-term medical issue where they are requiring and requesting additional assistance. The wellness piece and working with our staff to make sure they are as healthy as they can be in providing the services is a significant piece of this proposal. It's the services listed here are a part of it, but the wellness piece is hopefully an even larger part. How does this integrate with what we're currently doing? Uh, in the last year and a half, we've made significant progress with the wellness committee. Um, as you know, the board has changed the policy for staff for things like using the pool, the Intermediate School Fitness Center, prize sponsors have been provided for different activities, the Dean Nurse Coaching is off the ground and running, um, our current um, Dean Nurse Clo or our Dean uh, Nurse Coach Jesse has received many, many positive comments from our staff as to the services that she's providing for them. We share Jesse with the Sun Prairie School District, so between our two school districts, um, she is working with the staff in both districts um, to help folks with their medical needs. Uh, we talked about the handbook change that the board approved last summer, which is part of our goal to seek 100% participation in annual biometric and health assessments that creates the most effective wellness program. And our health contract with Dean has implications depending on what level we're able to reach for participation. So the clinic really is just a part of many other initiatives that we are trying to work on in the wellness area. The recommendation from the administration 
is to request approval on a trial basis of the wellness, wellness clinic from January of 2017 to June 30th of 2018. We want to be able to prove to you that this concept can work. We want to come back to you and show you the data and show you the information before we commit to something like this on a five or seven year type basis. So because of our recommendation to approach this as a trial, we're recommending a lease at the Arboretum Center space because we think it is the most cost effective option and the quickest option to be able to get a wellness clinic up and running. Uh, our goal is to actually have something available to staff to use as early as January of 2017. The total cost would be a little over $400,000 for an 18 month trial period. A $221,000 cost this fiscal year and $180,000 cost next fiscal year. Uh, for those of you who can remember, back in January of 2016, we presented a long-term uh, financial planning document to you that actually estimated a $400,000 cost to implement a trial for this program. So in the end, depending on which route we would go with location, if we rent a space, we would be very close to that. If approved by the board, what would come next? We would sign the lease, we would begin the remodel of the space. And just a quick point I would mention, we will have the option to renew the lease if we so choose. So as an example, if we can prove that this concept is effective and we've already invested the $70,000 in this space, the board could choose to re-up for additional one-year terms. That will, would be a part of our agreement. We would hire the nurse practitioner or physician assistant with oversight from Dr. Annam and feedback from the district. We would work collaboratively with the wellness clinic team to finalize the clinic startup. The targeted launch date would be potentially one of the no school days uh, to try to hold an open house so our staff could get over and, and see what the facility is all about. And then as I mentioned, the review process is very important. Uh, we are estimating that in March of 2018, we would evaluate the clinic design, the effectiveness, and the future of that type of a model. And please remember, our Dean long-term contract expires on June 30th, 2018, which would allow us to look at this concept in the larger picture of where our dean contract or whatever path we go, we can evaluate it. The clinic in the long run would clearly need to be self-supported, meaning we would need to be able to prove to you that there are enough savings from operating this type of a clinic to offset the cost. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is when you get something like this up and running, there's no way to have this be integrated into our initial claims renewal because they go back over a 12 month period of time. So these type of models do require an upfront investment initially to prove that they will work before the claims end up being reduced. And then a health plan design review would be appropriate at that time to better integrate the clinic if we choose to continue that concept moving forward. At this point, I know Dr. Annam, Al, Connie, myself would be happy to address any of the questions that you might have regarding this topic and thank you for your time. I do know also this was presented um, to the budget committee as well. Are there any comments that members of the budget committee have as a result of the initial, I guess, discussion? It was presented, but that, not all this was presented. Oh, I see. Okay, you didn't see all that. <coughs> we got presented a cost estimate, which I assumed was personnel and how it was going to go. Okay. We didn't know that options to that magnitude were looked at. I just saw in the notes that there was. A the, con the conversations that took place at the budget committee were around 
um, the dollars to get the, the clinic started the and the location of those. And we talked about fund balance and utilization of that. And then the aspects as far as the costs associated with the different options here were, were coming in in preparation for tonight. I think one important piece just to add is Administration rarely recommends the use of fund balance. Um, this is my 16th year here, I and mean, the only other time we recommended fund balance was actually the purchase of this facility. So when we purchased this facility, it was a combination of a non-referendum loan and fund balance in order to remodel it, that initial investment to get this facility where we wanted it to be. So recommendations to use fund balance are very rare, and recommendations to use fund balance typically come when it's an initial investment in order to get something up and running. We would not recommend an investment of this type from fund, mal fund balance on an ongoing long-term basis, but just in general, the way healthcare works in order to have something like this affect your claims and your premiums in a positive way, you have to invest in it up front. And that's typical with any wellness clinic, no matter what part of the state that you would be doing, you have to put some outlay first in order to do it. Our goal has been to minimize that outlay so that we can prove the concept works in this part of the state and in public schools. <coughs> Al could speak to this way better than I can, but this concept has been extremely successful in the Milwaukee area, the Fox Valley area, and other portions of the state. It's a little bit delayed in coming to this part of the state because our health care premiums are lower in Dane County than they are in Milwaukee or other portions of the state. Uh, we would expect we know there are other school districts in the Dane County area exploring this But we're the first ones to actually have a proposal out in front of our school board I can add something Steve at the September meeting when we brought this forward That was really built off the premise of most likely leasing the space and what the feedback we received from the board at that time Was to bring this back with some options with regards to keeping it in house part of the reason we had thought we had kind of moved away from that in September was we, we didn't have the numbers to an in-house piece, but we felt that those spaces didn't necessarily, in our vision, fit with what we were trying to accomplish. Um, but with, with per your request, that's really what's coming back here tonight. So um, I guess when we take a look at our, di our dialogues that took place at our different committee meetings, we could have filtered some of those pieces in here, and that may have helped some of the dialogue here tonight. So if there is a point where you're taking a look at this, you're feeling like that's just too new of information for a decision, we could move this until, and use this as an informational um, piece this evening, and move the decision to December. It just moves out our implementation of the clinic by, by a month or so, if that's the, the direction we want to go. Um, but Tonight's presentation is really kind of a, a, a follow-up to our September piece with some additional information, <coughs> the additional, um, I guess, discussion that's taking place um, between all the, the folks who've been at the table. Well, and I do appreciate your included, including all the different components that already are in place or ongoing, as, and, and this is just another component of it, because I know even at some of the listening sessions I've attended, uh, I see some head nods. I mean, unsolicited positive comments coming from staff already with some of the, the ability to access services through what currently exists, which is nothing like the model right now. So. Um, okay, I guess dialogue. Yeah, Julie? Yeah, a couple of questions for clarification. So the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant that works there is the Wanakee School District employee? Is this correct? The person would be hired by Dean and they would, be a, they would be a Dean employee. Okay. So great question. On the slide where we referenced the cost of running a clinic and it was about $15,000, uh, that would be a payment from the school district to Dean uh, to uh, pay for the services. So for example, the nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, the medical oversight from Dr. Annum, the lab supplies, that would be paid from us directly to Dean on a monthly basis. I guess I saw a kind of a reaction from Dr. Random. Did you want to make a comment, Joe? I, mean, well, I see I, you're the clinical the director. Part is 
me the, the key If you can come up to the mic, that'd oh, be great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 and this is Dr. Ren. You, you've been identified as the clinical director. Yes. Um, so part of the process, and, I, and now obviously you know some of this too, is that we, the, having the PA or whoever you're, you want to make sure that they're competent and that they follow our with standardized stuff, uh, they, they, they wouldn't be on as much of an island. Does that make sense? If that, that's what I wanted right. to clarify. So we're I was hopeful. To keep yes. Them into the main uh, flow of our what we do with everybody else, at, as far as PAs, docs, everybody else, that they're certified, appropriate, and obviously the, the district would have a, a component of that as far as people. So, so to follow up and related to that, but there would just be one employee at that location, correct? Correct. The scheduling would be. From some off-site number, they're calling that's Correct. doing the scheduling, and it would. Right, uh, it, it, right. We have scheduling services that we use for other sites right. that are exist. I mean, so that that part of the pile you shouldn't have to deal with very much. I mean, it, it would kind of come down to what the district wishes to do. I, I suspect that like Jesse would have people that she would say, "Hey, you know what? You're going in there, and that might be a local call, not through the." To me, the benefit of this is that it's local calls. You know, like, you don't look well, you're going over there. I mean, you're, this, it just speeds the line. Yeah, I, I guess my concern was what if you get two or three at once? And you've got, you've got the one PA that's back in the exam room with somebody well, else. Our experience, and, as far as at the clinic, is that you won't have, that the line will still be quite short okay. for the population that you have, as far as the, um, that you're trying to serve. And I don't have an exact number on that. Uh, I think it's around 1,000, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Somewhere around. So that line, one person should be able to serve that line easily because most of the work and not all the work will be going through them you know if they had to do all the work that would be but some of the work will be some of the work will be sent out Got to it. other sites okay so, but so. others can't so like they'll be re-sterilizing all the surfaces themselves they'll be restocking right. all the supplies oh, yeah, themselves they'll I be think ordering all the schedule in, as we, I see it I don't, I, I don't think that's going to be a difficult. I do, our clinical people, that, again, the reason to have Dean is the clinical people come and say, here's the process we need yep. to use. Because so the, the school would have to invent that. Okay. Um, now, I think it could be done that way, but it would take a lot, it would take somebody taking over that process. And I don't know, I don't want to do it. No, <laughs> that, 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 that's what I thought it was going to complicate who to hire. Right, yeah, so, that's, so that's using, the, the, using the processes that are already used by other places. Sure. I mean, at our other sites is what I expect. Sure. I think it's uh, an excellent, uh, again, speaking unquestionably, I mean, as far as the, uh, the wellness thing, I think that is uh, a, a, a big piece of this as far as the long run we would have. I would be jealous of the ability to contact these people. No, we don't have that. That's it. We need to have that lesson there. Thank you. Okay. How many, um, how many people uh, do you think would go through here on a daily basis? You know, we go through, you know, I, I would. I would assume that there's a ramp up where there's a few people initially and then more and more people get comfortable with it. Al, could you speak to your experience in other locations? Do you want to come to the and, mic? And I guess the next question, kind of the follow-up question to that then would be the space that uh, has been identified, you know, is that a long-term space or would you have to expand that space? Um, I'll tag team this with you. You don't mind. Um, as far as the ramp up, one of the things you um, may recall on the wellness component, which was part of the, what was drafted in the HR handbook, right. was the participation in the biometrics, which when you are managing a population that is just the staff members and their spouses and their dependents in a district, you now have um, a population of information that you know, individuals, while they complete that biometric, may very well have this nurse practitioner with them. I know, for example, when you conducted them this past year, voluntarily, voluntarily, <coughs> struggle with the word, um, you had the nurse liaison there helping uh, talk through and possibly, if people had questions, they could um, ask them about what my cholesterol, et cetera. My point to that is, it wouldn't be just those individuals that would just think, I have a condition, do I want to go to a local clinic? The other way is, it's kind of a step ahead of what would be deemed traditional primary care, where you also have individuals that are collecting data earlier, and you have a nurse practitioner, 
collecting data earlier that they can share and start coaching. So it's not just the reactive, mm -hmm. I have a condition. We're now trying to, uh, trying to create just an earlier step where people are getting more information. We're, we're getting, hopefully, 100% participation. And as a result, it's just that much more proactive in uh, communication. So back to the history of it. When you have those components, which you, you know, as we see them piecing together, um, it, it, it shortens the ramp up period of time just because they're active, actively engaged early. Does so that when help you open, answer your question? When, when you open uh, January 16th or 19th, uh, the next day, are you going to have five people in there? No. One person? Ten people? Oh, I. Uh, and then it ramps up to so a hundred. That estimate that we get used at our clinic is 1%. For urgencies, I mean, okay. so that's and I, so I would say ten. I mean, that's I mean, you count the weekends, maybe twelve. Depends on that would be, but they will vary depends on the flu comes. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Those. And then uh, is this a, a forty-hour work week for this individual, or is there nights and weekend coverage, or you know, how does that work? The initial setup, I think. Was, was talking about was 11 to 7. Yeah, yeah. right. It, and, and that, I think, is open. I, I, I didn't know if we closed that. I don't know if we talked about the four years. It, it depends on, I think that would be, again, speaking on Turner, but that would depend on sort of what the district found the demand was at. I mean, we, this um, type of thing, would, we would adjust it to demand. You know, but I, I personally don't know whether mornings is better than night. I feel that 7 is a little late for mm -hmm. most of us. Mm -hmm. In our other sites, usually by six, mm -hmm. most everybody wants their kids in their house and of course close. So, but that's I, mean, I think we'd be open to whatever the fluctuation. So the eighteen months would just be to kind of gauge utilization and workout scheduling and things like that. And to Steve's point too, a couple things with the eighteen months: not only to feel things out, get everything up and running. But as of July of 2019, I think it was 18, 18 the same year. I'm yeah. just ahead. July of 2018 would be the end of the 18 month um, arrangement. And everything's clean because we start over with the new contract with Dean. We, everything's fresh and new. And I have to tell you, um, in the insurance side of the equation, it's a lot more attractive and a lot more appealing for the carriers to look at this and say we're willing to get more aggressive because they have all these components built in and they're serious about the wellness piece and we've seen much more aggressive renewals and what's interesting is we think five percent relatively speaking from an increase is a decent renewal increase well five percent represents about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in and of itself. So over the course of a few years, we could pay this, the return on investment could more than pay itself out. Off. Joan, you had some questions. Um, I was just wondering about the uh, medical records. I'm assuming that they would have like the EPIC system. Um, right, the EPIC system, and you can do it over the, we, I use the EPIC at home. Okay? So I, the question would be whether you create a separate environment or not. I mean, and that I haven't. I, all the, information should be able to be placed straight into their team. So that it's everything that happens there is known. Does the current nurse that we're using have access to that? Right, she so would with the confidentiality rules. Right, so they, they those records are all available currently. Good. Related to the other part on the cost, I was curious, do we have any idea how much uh, was spent for those types of visits last year without this model? Because it's, it's kind of a limited kind of visit. I mean, do we know how much of our premiums were paid out because of urgent care or these types of visits? Um, when we looked at the fee-for-service equivalents of those procedures, top of my head, um, it was in the same ballpark of what the, and that was on a 12 month basis, and it was within the same ballpark of what your 18 month projection is. 
Yes, we did do that. Okay. Uh, Al went we back to Dean and gathered the specific data on those particular services Visit. to see. Um, and it appeared, again, that was just taking a snapshot in a given period, so you would think that that's representative of a typical year, but it appeared from that perspective that there would be an equal trade-off, not necessarily a benefit, but it would at least be equal. And then the wellness piece is really where the long-term investment would pay off. So we thought at a minimum, we'll break even on those services, but where we can really excel is on the wellness end. And then the other thing that I was we were hearing occasionally you know, through some of the sessions is um, the convenience associated with having um, something that's under the control. I mean, like even you know, you you don't have to schedule uh, and leave school and get a sub in some cases, so that there's there's a it it, it increases the uh, chances of getting something taken care of earlier rather than later, um, but also just that it, it relieves a bit of the uncertainty uh, and, and associated with I'm not sure if I can get my child in because they are you know, got this kind of thing and having this kind of control in a way um, as opposed to access. Access, yeah, that's really the better thing for Is this something that uh, you could uh, potentially look at not only for the school district but actually the uh, village employees as well? You know, so that uh, it could be a shared service. They would love to piggyback on top of this, but mm -hmm. I will say, having done this in multiple communities, most recently we plugged the clinic model in, in Oshkosh, the, the city, the the school district in the county mm -hmm. and the biggest challenge when you start combining is you just added several not only months probably years to the process because getting everyone synced up is a, 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 a longer term proposition but, but could it be eventually a they could certainly so add that, on uh, we could we could add it on absolutely. especially seeing we're having it up, putting it into an offsite absolutely would that say it would it save? Um, well, you, from a scalability standpoint, you'd, you'd be sharing in cost. Now, one of the challenges is the village is aligned with the UW system, interestingly enough, and you know, obviously the district will align with the uh, Dean St. Mary system. So that, that would make a challenge, but it would certainly, you'd be sharing in the fixed cost, mm -hmm. so that would certainly save money. Uh, and the other benefit of it is, by having more population, you may be able to increase services that would be available. And the one additional thing, I know we talked about trying to save just from the claim of transitioning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I will say, don't do it for that reason. Because in the end, the true savings is not Got it. transition. It's from the, the wellness component, it's from the longer, I mean, how do you save money on claims? You pay less for the claims, yeah. or you pay less of the claims, or you have fewer claims. We're trying to have fewer claims, and that's ultimately where your real ROI is on this initiative. It's not, I don't think it's on the other two categories. Well, I appreciate your honesty on that. Yeah. I haven't heard from everybody, but yeah, I mean, I've got, um, I'm the nurse practitioner, it's at 40 hours a week. <coughs> what is that time? I'm sorry, what is that? When what? you were looking at the, the nurse practitioner saying that it would be available 40 hours a week, which means this clinic is 40 hours a week? Correct. Okay, so what's the time window on that? You mean like from a, what time from of the day? One. Yeah. I think uh, I've heard that this is kind of to be seven. determined. It'll okay. depend on to be determined. Because I mean, I, I guess when I'm looking at a feasibility on something like this is that for me, location is important in that if it's too far away from the school during the day, it's not going to get touched. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's too inaccessible based on the time window, it's not going to get used. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing is, is that if you were talking family, I believe even to some degree and everything, during the school day, it's going to be about as most clinics and not seeing a lot of people. And they're all waiting to get there right at the end of the school day or something like that. So I, I guess I with sitting there saying it's to be determined, it seems like that's almost a major part of the effectiveness of Absolutely, I agree, and that's been a fair amount of the discussion. Mm -hmm. 
the main, the initially the, um, call it 10 to 6, 11 to 7 was discussed as initially, and that was really to post the position so that, and, and as well as begin the, the initiation of it, knowing that um, as a system, when the Dean St. Mary's system was looking at it, there wasn't a strong feasibility analysis that could be done initially, but to, to uh, Dr. Random's point, part of it is once you get it off the ground, the system is willing to be nimble in adjusting those hours according to what they're seeing, hearing, feeling as they become part of the fabric of the day. And it has to be demand-based, mm -hmm. you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it may be that early morning is best. We don't know. I don't know anyway. I mean, I haven't been through it. It doesn't sound like that my place, but early morning is better. We've already done that at our site. So, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a matter of what you, what the demand curve is. I, I don't know how to predict that right now. So the other areas that you said you, there's some experience, you know, with this, it's outside the D. I mean, Dean St. Mary's doesn't have much experience in this right now. It's kind of one of their first. Right, except we've done it with our, at our own clinics. We yes, work. right. I mean, right. so but, okay. all we know is that those, like you're saying, the early and late hours are always popular. Got and, it. And, okay. and that it won't be that, I just don't want to lock, I didn't want to speak for the others that lock somebody to 11 to 7 and say, and it turns out that uh, 6 to 4 is better. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. not yeah. someday. So yeah. that those things happen. Yeah, those things would be. Uh, question and a comment. Uh, the question, the practitioner will be contracted for the 18 months, I'm assuming? Correct. Correct. The, the objective would be to contract the practitioner for 18 okay, months. Because I, I think that personal recognition is a huge mm -hmm. piece and I'd be a little bit nervous if, because they're part of the dean system, there'd be f dean fluidity to move into, uh, you know, from this clinic to another, and all of a sudden we have one practitioner, then six months later a different one might come in. Right. Um, I, I agree with you, Mark, and that's our intention, is to get somebody in here that will build a relationship with our staff. They'll be comfortable, they'll, you know, they'll take advantage of the opportunity. So, um, yeah, we expect it to be one person. Okay, all right, great. Then the comment, I just, uh, I've worked with the WTA in my past with insurance issues and, and trying to control costs and what have you, and um, I'm thrilled with the leadership and the work that Steve, Connie, the, the, uh, Dr. Adam, Al, the committee. Um, I really believe that we have to be proactive at a local level to try to contain uh, what costs we can and to show responsibilities to the powers statewide that might want to come in and, and try to regulate things. And so uh, to me, it's a worthwhile venture, and uh, I'm very excited about the potential. Thank you for all you guys have done. I guess I'd like to ask a couple questions. And more on the school district side is in picking location, when you looked at the, when you came up with kind of the top three, which two are inside the intermediate school, when you looked at those um, about the cost, one of them wouldn't take up any classroom space so that we would still get the same seat effectiveness out of the intermediate school, correct? The office space wouldn't impact our student seat space? That's correct. Um, and the other effect of when we were, when you were looking at it, the consideration of time, whatever, especially during the day on, did you have any impression as to whether it'd be easier for the teachers to be to intermediate or out to that park, and the effectiveness on the parking lot situation at intermediate, if anything like that started to happen. That's a great question. You know, we've received different types of feedback from folks when it comes to the topic of a wellness clinic. You know, privacy is very important for a number of people, so we have had some staff indicate that having this at a location not connected to a school would be preferable to them because then there wouldn't be the concern that who is, you know, I'm on security camera, I'm using my badge, the whole nine yards. And so we have had people say that having it some other location is their preference. Others have said the opposite. So schools that have started these, um, there are those embedded <laughs> in school facilities and there's those that are embedded in rental spaces. So there's no 
you know, right answer one way or another. It's just kind of personal preference. One of the things that we would like to do when we have a further discussion about this topic for the long term is really talk about the location. Uh, we feel for a trial period it makes the most sense to keep our investment as low as possible, but that doesn't mean the permanent location for this maybe shouldn't be somewhere in the heritage complex. It doesn't mean maybe uh, some other facility that should be discussed. As we know, we've talked about different options at the Teaching and Learning Center. Uh, we know there's other discussions going on in the community about other spaces. So in the long term, we think we would want to have a discussion if this model can prove itself out as to where is the right location for this. In the short run, we believe this is the best uh, decision that we can, best recommendation based on keeping the outlay as low as we can to prove that this can work. But we would really love to have that discussion with the board where would the long-term home be if this model is successful? I personally like that kind of an approach rather than investing a lot of fixed cost into something and then find out, oops, well, maybe it isn't the right thing to do. I mean, for what it's worth, given the relatively low cost. Well, I mean, looking at that, I mean, I understand trying to keep the low cost up front. My only thing is I'm sitting there looking, you just drop 20% of your facility costs on a temporary situation mm -hmm. where no matter what, well, <laughs> that's not true. I should say that. The, pos pro the probability is that you wouldn't end up staying at that first location and you basically, 100,000 of that roughly 130,000 is non recoupable And, you know, you pay to renovate a space that you're, you're probably going to have for a year and a half. That, that it was makes me a little queasy, but I also understand it's 20% of the cost if you scrub the project. You save 80%. It's costing you 70000 for your build-up, and it's costing you a rental fee every year of 24000 mm -hmm. So, so you've got an ongoing cost that, that can continue with that. My point is... I get sticker shock when I see by half million and eight hundred thousand. So when I saw that mm -hmm. this weekend, I wasn't at all pleased. When when we talked about this, that was it was something we thought we could just incorporate into our school and you make it work. As it gets investigated by everybody, that doesn't happen, and, and probably should have known that. I don't like a reoccurring fee where we're paying rent to some place. I do, to your point, I think it shouldn't be in a school. I think it should be someplace else, and the problem with ours is it could be in one school, but it's still not close to another school, and that's going to get worse and worse. So, it, it, I, and I don't know where that's going to go. We're going to see see different things. To me, that what's it that old admin building would have been a good spot, depending on how you could make it work. I don't know what the build out would have been, but then we would have had it in a place that it's ours, not someplace we lose. Um, I'm not for any time that we lose classrooms. We just do referendums and. And that, I get that question all the time. I just got it the other day again about the high school when that was done. It was this many, and then you do a referendum, and it's supposed to be this, and it seems like it's not that somewhere's down the line because the rooms get used someplace else. And this, this is an example of how that happens, and all of a sudden we, we're building because we use stuff up. So to me, if we can do it without it taking up classroom space, and the intermediate is our one now, and the high school, that they have lots of room, and all of a sudden somehow we don't have room later would rather not see that happen. Um, as much as it isn't, th this whole thing comes about because we're trying to save costs on our premiums and saving costs for our workers and to the district itself. So I'm for the plan. I voted for the plan in the budget without seeing exactly the details of where this went and was confused on where it went. Now i got to kind of figure it out. But I think it's a great thing to do for our employees. I think it's a great thing to do. It's, it's the way medicine's going if you're going to keep your premiums lower, which is how we're going to save money. I'm not perfectly solved with where it is and how we're spending there, but I think this is the most reasonable. And I think it is going to change in 18 months on where we do that, but we can plan a little bit for that then and look at some different sites and opportunities maybe coming up in the next 18 months that might give us a chance. Now, that said, we did know something about this with the building, <laughs> some of the building stuff that we were doing, 
and somehow we dropped a ball, we should have, we could have incorporated that in to one of those schools as a separate thing when we had the construction people there mm -hmm. with the intermediate, because we've been messing with this for a year, right? So something to, that we should do in the next 18 months as we're doing that. Well, I'll, I'll say that based on what I saw in the layout on the, on the intermediate school and everything and moving heritage, whether we incorporate it in then or do it now, it would have been similar. Because we didn't touch that area if you're looking at the office space. So therefore, the cost of renovating the office space would have been the same no matter when we did it. And it touches no classrooms. So we don't lose classroom space and it didn't affect any of the initial bill. So in a weird way, we're kind of touching an area that wasn't touched before. But then I'll say a half million to 800,000 is crazy. For, for what this is then. Well, yeah, but when you look at the type of space you're talking, you're talking medical space. And there are very specific code requirements for medical space over anything else. Electrically, water, and all that other stuff is, has a much higher requirements than a school building. And it's always gonna be a little more expensive square footage to do a medical than to do any, any other type of space. Some of the costs were escalated with regards to trying to put a, even though it's it's employees and their families, kind of a public space into a into a school, yes. and making sure that it operates separate from people being able to get into the other aspects of the school. So some of it was the kind of the safety isolation piece of it. There's also a part that we've had conversations about of just it. it in order for, for staff to use it, they have to feel comfortable going there. It has to be a nice space. If it's not, if it's not welcoming, if it's not, we're not going to get to the benefit where we need to be. So that was the other piece we looked at was how do we renovate it in a location that keeps our other part of the school functioning the way it was intended and also create the kind of space that's inviting where our staff want to go. And so those were all kind of the pieces that kind of went into some of those discussions. I think uh, I support uh, going to the site off site because I've, I'm hearing around the table here, we don't want to lose class space. And even though the office is not a class space at this point, you could potentially renovate it to some type of school activity. So well, maybe an interesting question is, uh, of all these wellness things that have been done, how many have failed? How many got shut down? Or how long have some of them been running? Um, We've not been involved with any clinics that have failed. We're probably working with 25 different clinics, the longest one, probably 14 years, on, uh, somewhere between 10 and 14 years uh, in the Fond du Lac area. Um, and uh, are there some that have uh, failed? Yeah, I think they failed. The, the ones that I, we kind of get brought in seemingly after the fact, but some of those that have failed, frankly, are those that don't have a clear vision of what it is they're trying to accomplish. And I would say largely it's because, um, you know, they're either adding a layer of cost without understanding that it should be wellness focused, or they're adding a, uh, a layer of cost without understanding um, you know, what, what the true way of changing the medical trend and without tying it to biometric exams so that there's more information available and coordinating the insurance arm with the clinic arm I would say is those the ones that I've seen not do well but I have not been involved with any or we haven't statewide been up there. I mean I've, I saw this model early on as I was leaving the military we were starting to see regional wellness centers popping up based on military hospital units sitting near other type of units. And they were starting to say, why are we sending them to military hospitals when we don't have to? And it was trying to regionalize these little local wellness centers with the concept that it saved a lot of money and effort on people to be closer to their work to get their care, and it was more under control of their work. So you weren't seeing as many people losing time at work. Um, and the one thing I, I feel is looking at this is when you hear that there's 25 of them you guys have done, and probably most of them based on this pattern of wellness 
and limited care. Not trying to say, are they going to be mini ERs? You know, that's not going to happen yet. Some people seem to, I remember some people seem to think they were going to be. And it's like, no, that's not what you're going to be doing there. Um, and with that vision and that layout, they seem to always succeed. And you never seem to see them disappearing. That's why I, I got to admit when I saw this board packet, my, my first thing was we're dropping six figures for temporary. And, I, and I, I really cringed at that because in the long run, you're going to pay the rest of that bill. I, I personally believe putting it in the school, putting it under our control, getting rid of an ongoing recurring cost is going to save you a lot more money in the long run. We're not giving up classrooms because this area is non-classroom. And I, I don't know. I, I guess I, <laughs> I look at a proposal like this is we either do it or we don't. And the concept of we're going to try it for 18 months, giving up 20% of our total cost, just because $100,000 is a lot of money. And if we're going to spend it here, I'd rather spend it all and do it right than basically turn around and have to spend another half million later after giving up the 100000 So are you proposing to uh, put it in the intermediate? I would say, yeah. I mean, what, why would we build a permanent facility off-site? Un not under our control with a landlord situation that could shut you down any minute. Any time that they say, oh, we decided to renovate this building and get rid of it. Go find another place to rent. You just dropped a six figures into setting it up. You're going to have to do it somewhere else for another six some figure. I, I don't, because of it being that type of a long term proposal and you want people to feel comfortable with it and where it is, that doesn't make sense. And if you want it to work during the day when people are working, you don't send them 15, 20 minutes away. That doesn't help. And while, yes, we have some schools in different areas, let's be honest, we have a very central cluster of the vast majority is in one spot. That we control access, we control the setup, we control the hours, we control the parking, we control all of that. I would, I would almost go towards this proposal, try it out, and then in our next referendum, put it into uh, the next school building. Next referendum, I hope it's more than five years away. It better be. It better be. <laughs> That's why we did the way we did expanding the size of the intermediate so that we would have to have that. And even but, if the next but that's your long term planning, that's where it goes. Uh, and then you've got it under, under control. I think, uh, I, I think Randy and some of the discussion is uh, correct is people have to be uh, feel comfortable going to it. Uh, I think uh, the other thing is parking, you know, uh, depending upon when this is going to be utilized, do we have enough parking to uh, support that? Um, and out, out in this facility, or out in that area, uh, you've got the parking. Okay, um, two more questions, then we'll kind of close the discussion and see if we can have a motion. Um, I, I'm just curious, and it does need to get brought back up, I brought it up in the budget meeting, you know, Dean is proposing this to us, and I get that um, it's it's sold with two potential really big <coughs> benefits. Obviously, wellness to our people and better care of our people is the primary one, but make no mistake, I mean, it's being sold to us that it's going to decrease costs, and I guess my assumption was, since this was Dean's proposal of a model, I didn't understand why they weren't providing the space at their own clinic. Why are we even talking about space? They're in the medical space business. Why don't we just have a room here? Now, that's been addressed, I guess. The other part of my concern is we're already waffling that don't expect to see these lowered costs soon because this is all long term and it will take us a while to reap the wellness benefits with our people. So. I guess I'm a little disappointed that we don't have harder numbers in terms of uh, what did we spend on those kinds of visits last year and then to be able to compare that to whether this model makes those visits cheaper. The person is one part, so I was led, to, I understood it that that's the part we were paying for, the person, but I mean obviously there's going to be medical supplies as well. 
how does that all work? What do they charge us for tongue depressors and Tylenol? Is it, is it like any other insurance person charges a patient for Tylenol? I mean, I, those costs too are gonna get passed on to us, whatever gets consumed in that facility. You're getting a good service. Go ahead. So, part of my point earlier that, back to your main point of, are we going to be able to save, and how much are we going to be able to save? And one of the things Dr. Random said, you know, from an an analytics and taking a look at things, we did look at what the cost was, and we could very well save more than what we're paying for the fixed cost based on last year when we looked at it. There was more spend there than what we're spending accordingly. What we don't know, the reality is we're changing behavior patterns. We don't know how many of the behavior patterns are going to change. So the secondary part of the strategy is come July of 2018, depending on where we are, come July 2018, the next step is what plan design changes do we need to make to maybe create additional incentives to increase. And those plan design changes are also more palatable when you have a zero, low or no cost option to go to this nurse practitioner. And you can save on the premiums, which can more than offset by the plan changes more than offset the additional fixed cost then. The more of these fixed costs though that get passed on to us, I just hope there is a realization that that will give us leverage to play hardball with other insurers. So we appreciate the help, but. Yeah. <laughs> Mark? Well, I think Julie oh, and honey, maybe honey, even. Oh, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on a comment that Julie made so that you all know we did thoroughly investigate the possibility of having space within the local Dean Clinic. Initially we thought that sounded like a fantastic idea, but after having quite a few conversations, it was clear to us that that wasn't the best option. And, and for reasons um, that the staff at the local clinic did not feel that that was the best option. And they have patients other than Wanakee School District staff that they're worried about. And they didn't want to create this differenti differentiated type of treatment for a person when they walk into the clinic. Well, you get the fast line because you're a Wanakee School District staff member. You're one of our other patients, so you've got to sit and wait for a while. So, I mean, that's oversimplifying. But we really did look at that. And then as far as um, other costs, um, the Dean Clinic will stock our clinic with supplies at a slight markup for cost. So it's not going to be the you know, $10 per Tylenol. It's a slight markup and we'll, um, we'll pay as we go, as we use. I, I think that's really important you address those for the public. So thank you, Connie, because I know the questions were asked. Mark Andrew. <laughs> My point, I think, in response to Dave's concern, I, I, I see on one hand where it might be a future benefit to have the work done and be permanent so we can go forward, but you know, when you're looking at almost a half a million dollar difference between the Arboretum site and the, and the cheapest, uh, uh, least expensive outlay for the intermediate, this is a trial. And, you know, if after 18 months the numbers don't bear as we hope they will, then we're going to have to make another decision. Okay, are we going to continue with ongoing study or are we going to embrace because we see the real value here? And so, um, as a good steward of our taxpayers' money, I, I would, I feel much better going with the impermanence of a trial versus committing mm -hmm. 500 mm -hmm. extra thousand dollars of building costs yep. to something that we don't, we can't unequivocally okay. say it's going to succeed. Mm -hmm. We think it will, but that's, that's quite a bit, uh, bet that we'd be laying down on something that we're still not certain. Uh, we'll, it, it could be the best intention, but if our staff don't embrace it for things beyond our control, mm -hmm. then it may not work. And so it, this, I, I think uh, this is really for the taxpayers the best thing we can offer. And I agree with Mark and with Julie, and I think the timing is so important. Mm -hmm. You 
now if we go to the intermediate, it probably delays it another whole semester, and then it's, you know, I think it's really important that if possible we can get it up and running by January. I also think that because we don't know how it's going to be received, that offsite might be embraced so much better. And even time, having it offsite, people might say, well, yeah, it doesn't really matter if I go to this school or this school. I think just that, that 18 months where people kind of get used to going to this clinic model might allow us to say, yeah, it can work in a school. I'm not sure the school is the best place right now. And, you know, I, I guess I would like to think about um, has the, I think the village talked to you about the old library. Mm -hmm. That would be a great site. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we can have a district owned place, but not the school. Okay, um, are we ready for the program? Oh, donate that to um, Don't write that. <laughs> is there a motion to approve of the plan as presented? And then there's actually also, I think, action that needs to be taken on use the use of district fund balance, both of those within one motion. I move that we accept. The, the proposal and utilize the fund balance to cover the cost for this 18 months. Second. Can you just second it? Any other comments? I want to echo everything that we've shared, and I'm glad we've had the opportunity to have this kind of dialogue <laughs> and the work that's been going on over the X number of months on this. I do sincerely appreciate um, everybody's input and willingness to listen and, and I think this is a great way to try this out. So uh, there's a motion on the table with a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you everyone. Can we do two and three along? We've got staff along. Um, sure. Okay, because the Lincoln community is if you want to go to a multi-level yeah, system. Can, let's, I'd like to move the agenda around a little bit. If we can have item three, since we've got staff here for the multi-level systems of support. So, um, just as a, a mode of introduction, I think everybody knows I'm Janet Thomas, our Assistant Director of, of Student right. Services. Um, when Julie was talking about mm -hmm. the events that she attended here a few weeks ago, that was a piece that's related directly to what we're talking about tonight which is multi-level systems of support, specifically as it reflects on uh, student behavior. So I'm gonna turn it over to Janet and thank her for, for pulling this together and leading this initiative in our district. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you, Julie, for introducing this and the board report, and thank you for attending. That was really nice to be the board member there and have all the staff see um, what we're doing. So part of the work in student services is really looking at a multi-level system of support, and so I'm gonna introduce that topic to you tonight and then certainly answer any questions that you might have as we move through this. Um, so as Steve pointed out in their presentation, you've all seen the district planning, and this is my one animation, so everybody watch it, here we go. Um, so <laughs> this, is where, this is where we are, this is where multi-level systems of support fit within the district strategic plan, but I will say that although it is under student services, the work that's gonna be done really goes across different domains and areas of focus. Um, a lot of our work in, st in student services really bleeds through all of those areas of the district strategic plan. Um, so this uh, particular graphic is one that you may have seen if you've attended different conferences or um, read different things about what's going on in schools of the last 10 years. Um, this triangle is really a graphic that describes a multi-level system of support. And just as its name um, indicates, we're really talking about just a, a framework and organization for different levels of how we support kids and their different needs and meeting all of their needs. Um, we have three levels that are really indicated in this graphic. The first one sort of permeates through the whole triangle and that really is like our universal instruction. So that green part going all the way up to the top really is the universal instruction and that really meets the needs of say 80 to 90 percent of our student population. So for both, um, for example, for academic instruction, that universal instruction is kind of what we're looking at for, for all students, and it meets the needs of 80 to 90%. Then we have some students, about five to 10% of a student population, that they need more than the universal curriculum. They need more than that universal instruction. 
And so we say that they have kind of more supplemental supports that are needed. And then we have few students, so one to five percent of our student population, that need something more than just the universal supplemental supports. They need more intensive interventions, kind of at the top of that triangle. So we have a really well-developed academic, that left side of the triangle, we have a really well-developed academic system of support. Um, a more common term that you guys may have heard is RTI, the response to intervention. That sort of globally, people understand that as the academic side of the triangle. So those tiers of support there for academics. Um, we also, and we are all figuring <coughs> out kind of a coaching model as best practice for professional development. And so we, I, we include it on the bottom of the triangle there, that that coaching kind of permeates through the whole um, of our systems of support so that we make sure that we are implementing all of these levels with um, fidelity and with success. And um, our lit coaches are an example of that. And you'll see as we talk more, there's some um, coaching that comes along with, with these multi-level systems of support as well. So I've addressed kind of the academic piece of it and coaching. I'm gonna focus for the rest of the time really on that behavior side. Go on. Janet, um, before you go on, just something that I have heard um, at many of the sites in the last listing are staff members concerned on the academic side of students at the younger ages, K to three maybe, or K to two, not receiving services early enough. And I don't know what kind of process, identification, it seems like the identifications are less than they used to be. Is that the RTI model? Is that being mandated? I don't, ever, I don't know how to respond to them. If there's anything you could Sure. Are you talking specifically about academic intervention? Academic intervention. Well, and behavioral, I think. Um, yeah. Because they go hand in hand. They do go hand in hand. But kids that aren't being successful, you know, we hear it year after year. We see them in second grade. We see them in first grade. We see them in second grade. But it takes until fifth grade before mm -hmm. they get identified and receive services. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really two different kind of conversations to have there. I guess that I would like to, for now, focus on the behavioral side okay. of it, but okay. I will say that in all of our buildings, we have very um, well-defined criteria for meeting the academic needs for kids. And really, when we talk about identifying kids, I'm not sure if you're referring to for, for special education or down that path, but we do identify kids fairly early and consistent, consistently around some very specific criteria around our testing that we have um, for academics. And um, I think that we are doing more along, if we go back to the triangle, kind of more along really making sure that our universal instruction for both academics and behavior is robust and consistent, and it's really meeting the needs of most of the kids. And then we have some really specific criteria for identifying those some of the kids that you may have heard the term getting a tier two kind of intervention for academics, and that could be delivered by a classroom teacher or a reading specialist or math interventionist. If I could just interject, John, why don't we just take, I'll, I'll note that piece and I'll make sure we bring that piece back. Because okay. I, I think it's, it, it just requires mm -hmm. a little bit more of a, of a discussion on some of those items and we can talk a little bit more in depth of kind of what our experience is at those lower levels with kids who are struggling. And then we can bring that back at a, at a future meeting, if that's all right with you. Sure. And, and it's a great question because we really are trying to tie those two things together. So it is a complete picture. You know, to Mark's point, academics, but also behavior. You know, how are we tying both of those things together? So, did you have a specific question? Like, we'll, we'll keep it rolling here. Um, so, the importance really of that right side of the triangle, which I'll be focusing on tonight, is again, we're, we've really become pretty well versed in the academic side of that triangle, and so it's a natural expansion to the behavior side because we really know the strong connection between behavior and academic success. Also wanted to point out that when we're talking about behavior, we have to think about the whole continuum of behavior. And it's not just that explosive, verbally aggressive, physically aggressive behavior. 
we have a lot of evidence and data to support that kids are really experiencing mild internalizing things um, like anxiety or depression, um, things that are impacting their academic success that we just need to really start looking at in a more complete systemic, systematic way. Um, we have district data and also staff are reporting. I know you mentioned, somebody mentioned the board listening sessions. I know that you have all heard that increasing concerns about behavior in different um, settings across all of our buildings. And that really has shown over the last 10 years some pretty consistent concerns about behavior across all of our schools and district. Um, and then some measures we have indicate really an increase in behavior concerns. You know, we've talked a little bit in some pockets uh, about our increase in drug and alcohol use, um, the Dane County Youth Assessment, our increase in anxiety and depression, um, suspensions, expulsions. These are all kind of big things that have indicated maybe that we need to look at our system in a little bit greater detail. So there's a quote up there that you can read that I have actually printed and posted in my office. My point here is that really our behavior systems should be based on the same premise as our academic systems. And what I mean by that is that we have teachers who love to teach and are good at teaching. And so the, the premise here is that teachers daily teach not only the academics, but they teach behavior. They teach their behavioral, or behavioral expectations. And so I think, you know, at this time, it's really a good time to start formalizing some of those conversations um, with our schools and through the training that we're, we're working on. So really, the um, most well-known and well-regarded framework for a behavioral system, a multi-level system of support for behavior, is PBIS. And that's what Julia was, Julie, I knew I would do that. I have a 10-year-old who's Julia, and so for 10 years I say Julia. No worries. So Julie. Um, but PBIS really is positive behavior intervention in sports, <coughs> and this really is that multi-level system, that right side of the triangle. What this is is a school-wide teaching model and framework that includes all of those tiers that I introduced in that first graphic, and it really is that framework to, to guide our work um, on and around the behavioral systems. So really, initially looking at that universal instruction and expectation, and then moving towards what we're doing for those kids who maybe need more, and for the kids who need most. So looking at it for, through a real systems approach. So um, PBIS is actually not new to our district. About five years ago, we moved forward with it with interested schools and administrators. And at that time, it was Heritage, the Intermediate, and the Middle School. And they really wanted to pursue the training path that PBIS took them on. And kind of, we started with them. And we've continued to add layers of trainings and buildings. And what we've learned through that process is that it's really beneficial to have um, kind of a, a system approach to behavior, similar to academics. And it really became clear that it was helpful to identify that behavior education plan. And we started thinking, well, you know what, this would really help to solidify some of the, the conversations that we're having and really take a dive into what best practice is in reducing <coughs> behavior issues. Not only teaching behavior, but reducing behavior issues across our district. So this year, um, we moved forward with all six of our schools doing and starting the training and implementing Tier 1. So the three schools that have already gone through the training, they've had staff turnover. Um, it, it just, we're kind of differentiating a little bit for those three buildings, but it still is, and if you asked um, Dan or Chris or Marcy, I think that those teams still feel like it's beneficial for them to kind of review and refresh and get some new people trained on that tier one. Yeah. Um, we anticipate that this will be, go this will be an ongoing um, training timeline for, for PBIS as we move through um, the training. So what we have done so far is each building has identified teams, uh, leadership teams, 
and those include really a wide variety of teachers and staff. So it's teachers, it's specialists, it's paraeducators, it's student services staff, and those people are the school counselors, school psych, school nurses, um, school social workers, and administrators. Um, these are all staff who have volunteered to serve on this committee, either because of interest or a particular skill set. Um, the one group of people that we do have in each building, it's either an individual or a shared position, as I talked about the coaching model with our triangle <coughs> graphic. Um, we have internal coaches, and these are really teacher leaders that are helping to organize and facilitate the work. So the internal coaches are really important and will be really important as we move forward because they're really the connection to the training and the administrators as well as the team and the entire school staff. And I think that it will be really important for us to think about what path they're on and the role that they're taking. Um, it, I think that it may be beneficial for us to talk in the future about providing an additional stipend for them um, like we do for some of the other teacher leaders that we have in the district to our leadership roles in, within departments. I, don't, I apologize for interrupting this with the internal coach is a question I have. So does every school have coaches on site or is some being shared between one building and another? So every school has their own internal coach or it's a shared position between two people. And these are just teachers who want to take a leadership role within this process. So that's, this is in addition to the behavior coach? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, and that's a great point. Um, the way that the PBIS framework and system works is that there are internal coaches within each building, but there is also what's called an external coach um, who sort of helps guide the internal coaches in that work, and that is uh, me and Tessa now, Nigum now, she got married, uh, Tessa who is our behavior coach. So Tessa and I play a very important role in this process, but really this is a grassroots school so it's the staff who are really doing the work. Okay, so we have one behavior coach other than yourself to work with the six schools. Is that right. correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Um, family and community members also, you know, in the in the buildings that have been doing this for a little bit, they definitely try to engage families um, because we're trying to create a common language and expectation, and certainly we want families to have input on what those uh, expectations are and what that common languages around behavioral expectations. So those are the, the leadership teams. Um, the work so far this year, as I mentioned, uh, all schools have identified an internal coach in that leadership team. Uh, for tier one, we will participate in a series of four trainings. Two of those have already happened, one of which is the one that Julie attended. Um, there's one more in January, and then we'll do one at the start of the school year to kind of continue to engage in the work. The main job that the school teams are having right now, or doing right now, is to really develop that common language for the behavioral expectations that they have in their building. And then to kind of put some parameters and some definitions around minor and major behaviors. As I said before, that behavior kind of occurs on a continuum. What we have found is that sometimes the minor behaviors take as much work to intervene around as the major behaviors. And we think that we can change that a little bit by just doing some more school-wide sorts of things. Um, we're also working very hard to implement consistent data collection and a process for analyzing that behavioral data. And then finally, really to be using evidence-based practices to teach the behavioral expectations at the universal level. Um, and although we're taking a district approach to this to really promote that consistency and have everybody have the same knowledge base, Every school has their own climate, their own personality, their own population, and unique set of needs. So we certainly aren't expecting that we have district-wide um, behavioral expectations. Um, they really are unique to the buildings. Uh, I have to say that <coughs> they aren't very different, and there's only so many different expectations you can have in a hallway, but um, definitely letting the buildings have some of their own, uh, address some of their own unique needs and populations. So data tracking then, I won't go into specifics around data, but we do currently have a lot of measures that are being used um, not as consistently as we would hope, and that will be one of the goals so that we could really have more consistent data district-wide on this. 
Uh, we do have behavior referrals, and again, using that language of a minor behavior, so like being tardy to class, maybe blurting out, and then our more major behaviors, which are some of the things that maybe you have heard about in board listening sessions, more aggressive type behaviors, either verbally or physically. Um, we do utilize social emotional behavioral screeners in third through seventh grade. And we're hoping to expand that into the high school. Um, teacher referrals, just our building intervention team models are still a good way to get some information around behavior. We look at attendance grades. And then um, health office visits is something that over the last couple of years we've really looked at because we noticed that some kids who have more internalizing behaviors who are not problems in the classroom, but they manifest in other ways. Those types of kids who have some social anxiety or um, you know, some depression or those sorts of internalizing behaviors, they will often go to the health office. And so we've learned a lot about kids who visit the health office um, more than four times in a month, and we really kind of try and look at those kids too. We have a new tool in the district called EduClimber, which is a data visualization tool, which is basically just a warehouse for all of the data, and that is going to be really hugely beneficial to try to um, both aggregate and disaggregate our behavioral data so we can really make sure that what we're doing is working and we can see if there's any patterns throughout um, the district. Also in particular buildings, particular classrooms, um, we'll really be able to use that to measure our progress and success. So our goals for PBIS really now and ongoing is to truly build the capacity of staff. Um, not only to decrease the problem behavior, but really initially to just empower them to know that they can teach behavior and that our, our, um, our real goal is um, teaching behavior just as we teach academics and understanding that for some kids they just need that explicit instruction around how to behave in certain environments. Um, and we found it to be very successful um, when we do that. So we've organized leadership teams, attended the trainings, and then continued the work from the trainings. Even after our first full team district training, there's been a lot of work that has gone on in the buildings. I think every building has had their first um, universal team meeting, and Tessa and I are trying to attend all of those. So that's been really beneficial. Uh, a secondary goal then is to just kind of connect both sides of that triangle to make sure that people are connecting what they know and understand about identifying kids who need additional academic support to what they know and understand about kids who might need additional behavioral support. And then really finally just meeting the unique needs of every student so that they can be successful academically because we have kids who just need a little bit something different and more and those needs are important for us to address and just trying to do that in a real systematic way. Mark, so any questions? When I look at the goals, as a board member, as a, even as a former classroom teacher, how do I know that this has been successful? I mean, those are very non-specifics. Yes. Um, and I'm not saying they did it right or are doing it right, but you know, Madison, with some of their behavioral issues, they said, okay, this is the percent of kids we have who are being suspended, who are being, who are disruptive, who are being expelled. As a teacher, you know, th th to me, this looks fairly time intensive for a lot of the staff. Don't know if it is or isn't. I think, it, it, to me, it looks really worthwhile because of the comprehensiveness and consistency from one building to another. A lot of good ideas going out there, but there's a framework that kids' expectations will be uni sort of universal. But how do we know what problems are being solved? Mm -hmm. And so right now, what are the, you know, as a board member, I'm. So do we have numbers that tell us X amount are, are being disruptive, and so the goal here is to, to yes. eliminate that by 5%, right? Do we have anything concrete like that? Yes, we do. Um, so I, I wouldn't have the time to go through all of that today, but I can right. say that, that yes, we do, and these are really the, the data points that we have. Um, 
I think the, the, the thing that we're trying to get better at is to be more consistent with our data tracking. And before we can do that, we have to be consistent with what our expectations are. And also consistent with how we're defining minor and major behavior. Because if somebody in one building is calling, blurting out in class a major behavior, mm -hmm. and somebody in another building is saying, oh, I'm just reteaching around that, I'm not even putting that in as a behavior referral, or documenting that as a behavior referral, um, that can really skew our measure of if we're successful or not. So um, I know that those goals are not specific, but we first need to really get um, consistent with our data collection so that we know what our baseline is. I mean, I can tell you that we've got over 1,200 behavior referrals every year for the last 10 years. And I can tell you that um, we've got, you know, 20% of our population who is, or 10 to 20% of our population who on our screeners are indicating that they've got anxiety and some internalizing problems. Um, you know, I can tell you these things, but we're, we're getting to the point where we're more consistent, and then we'll be able to really specify a goal. Mark, one of the questions that Janet and Kurt and I have talked about is it's exactly getting at what you're saying. Is saying, well, what can we bring back here as data? Well, yeah. right now, I think what I think the most important piece that Janet said there was trying to build that consistency right now so that the data is good. It's not that we don't have data. We have numbers, and we have got referrals and all these things, but we want it to be meaningful in the context to say we've that these type of things are, are making a, a change and a difference, and trying to make sure that your interpretation is the same as mine if you and I are teaching next to each other. So that, what, so that the pieces that are getting entered into our system are clear. So that's where the piece of the edge climber is really an important tool for us as a, as a district to be adopting as a way for us to, to bring that piece, those pieces together, have some expectations. The work that, that happened at our, at our first meeting that Julie was part of was really going down to your, your basics of saying, where are the areas that we need to define behavior and what do those start to look like? The first steps that these groups are making it from and then we can start to collect consistent data that drives those. But, and we'll be able to show you kind of where we started, how we've clarified things and how things move forward. So in subsequent presentations on this type of a topic, you'll start to see some of the specifics that we're bringing out. So, so today is really saying, here's what PBIS is, because I'm gathering many of you have maybe heard about, we have some behavior concerns, how are we addressing it? This is our universal approach to <coughs> saying, Here's how we're trying to bring everybody into a framework, and here are the things that we need to be looking at to track to show you how we're making progress. If that helps. Joe, um, can you talk a little more about that edge climber? Is that um, like a? Is it part of Infinite Campus? No. Or a whole different system yeah. that? Is it digital? Do they log in? Do they handwrite it? How? does it? So, and that is probably, again, a topic that we'll need to come back because there's a lot of information that we could share. So, um, sorry, Joan, we're not answering any of your questions. <laughs> but I will say it is, it is not part I'm of I'm just it. setting the next meeting yes. up. Yes. So. <laughs> 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 or the next three. That's where we are wanting to go to be Yeah. I, I will say quickly, EduClimber is not part of Infinite Campus. There was a district leadership team of administrators and teacher leaders who this summer in July spent two days at a training to overview yeah. um, EduClimber. Climber, and then we've since adopted that in the district, and it is a fantastic tool. Yes, teachers log in, they have access to their class um, based on you know different rights that they have, and it is truly a unique um, visualization platform where you can sort and um, really pull and aggregate and disaggregate any kind of data you wanted. So if I wanted to see, you know, our third grade boys and how they were behaving in the hallway, I would be able to see that. So it's a very comprehensive tool that um, will be extremely beneficial as we work towards consistency. Well, I'm seeing a lot of different teacher input or extra analysis they're having to do and all that. Where are the parents brought into this? Um, yes. So. As schools, I'll go back to the triangle, this is probably the best visual to use this one. 
Um, as schools are developing and determining their school-wide expectations, um, they certainly share and get feedback from parents as they're talking about what those are. Um, and as we move through, and that really is the work right now. So the work right now at that universal level is making sure that we have a very clear understanding of wh how, what we expect students to do across our school environments and really defining that very specifically. Um, the buildings that have gone through this already, they really have shared with parents and gotten feedback from parents through open houses, newsletters that go home, and really just kind of creating that common language and expectation with parents and in the community. Um, so it, it's something that's very important to this process that we get feedback from parents and community. As we kind of move up the triangle, certainly parents are highly involved. Whenever we start talking about doing some additional tier two supplemental supports, parents are involved. And when we get up to kind of those few students who need that real targeted specific intervention, and definitely it becomes a family and community kind of a wraparound sort of support. So they're an important part of the process. see this item come back you will see some more progress that's being made and we'll be able to show, showcase some of the data aspects as well and the edge climber piece is a good reminder for us to really show what that can do and sometimes give a mini review of that as well. Okay, um, I'll go back to the linkage meeting um, and student mental health. Uh, this item is really a follow-up from our goals committee meeting that we had here just a few weeks ago. Um, at the goals meeting we had really an expanded committee of the, the goals committee itself, um, some members of the administration, but we also had members of the Wanaki Cares Coalition, and we had members of our high school, um, Ellen Grunder represented the Above the Influence student group. And what our purpose for that meeting was, was to review a linkage meeting or engagement activity with the community around student mental health and AODA issues. Really thinking this as being, this is a piece that we've talked about here this fall, and laid out as one of our objectives as a, as a district is to link in with the community and this being um, a key topic that we wanted to discuss. The, this really comes as a, as a great follow-up to some of the work that occurred here at the high school around the homecoming time when we had Amalia's Hope come in in a community engagement activity or a community forum in the evening to really talk about some of the issues relating, in that case, um, to a, a mother's story about her child um, dying of an overdose from, from heroin, but really opening up a dialogue around what's happening in the whole AODA spectrum in, in, in our community and how can we start to move forward. One of the pieces that came out of that Amalia's whole presentation was parents asking, well, what are the next step and what are some actionable pieces? So that was a, a really a, a focus of wanting to have this discussion with the Goals Committee and really laying out really a framework for us to really have this discussion and how can we bring this forward. So if you want to scroll down, Rebecca, I'll, I'll come back to who that is. So what we are thinking is we are setting a, the, the Goals Committee is recommending a time of Monday, December 5th from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock um, at the Wanakee Village Center. And this will be a, we're going to be in, at the top of this page, you saw a number of the folks that we're going to be inviting. and. Julie's working with me on just getting some of that, that language together to really send these out in the next day. But our, our whole premise is being that we want to be able to share some information, share some of our data, and also, most importantly, get feedback on how we can um, create some actionable items for us to be working on. And, and for that aspect, we really create are identifying three different groups to be targeting with regards to sharing data and getting input. One is obviously our, our school district staff. So working with Kurt Ailey, Janet Thomas, and the whole student services team, that is one aspect that we will be incorporating in. The second part is looking at the Wanakee Cares Coalition. And Jody Sorensen um, is, is working with Brian Kirsten on leading that initiative and trying to just get more awareness around some of the AODA issues in our community, sharing some of the Dane County Youth Risk Assessment data, and following the Amalia's Hope presentation, 
their numbers have grown. So we thought this would be a great group to really represent really a community dialogue around this issue. And then most I think one of the pieces we really felt was uh, important was to really incorporate students. So Ellen Grunder attended the goals meeting representing the Above the Influence Club. Um, Julie and I got an opportunity to meet with them. We, we sat with the group during contact time last Thursday mm -hmm. and really just talked to them about some of their questions and really shared what we were envisioning for this evening. But we'd like them to be able to share their perspectives of what's happening um, from a student's uh, lens and then also be able to really gather some input from people in attendance on what are some things that they can be doing. <coughs> so really the way we are setting this up is item number two, uh, we'll have a welcome at the very beginning. Item number two is these three groups really sharing some data pieces and sharing who they are and some input as far as what's our reality right now. And then really creating then three rotations around two each of these groups, the student services group from the, from the district, the uh, Wanakee Cares Coalition, and the Above the Influence group, where we're putting together some key questions to really generate a dialogue in a rotational basis where, where attendees will get to attend each of those three sessions and really start to idea, brainstorm ideas as far as what are some things that we can be doing or that those groups can then be forwarding as some action pieces. Um, what we look at after the after that two-hour segment, is really some, some um, thank yous and closeouts at the end, really setting up what our next steps would be, which would be those three groups coming back together. I'd probably see that as another goals committee or something of that nature, to really share what kind of data pieces that they received, and then talking about um, what are some of the actionable items that we can then take away from the student perspective, community perspective, and the school district. So, and in a two hours, that's uh, quite a bit to cover, but I think it's a pretty important topic to really try to really ad address those three pieces. What my hope is, is that we're able to gather some next steps, <coughs> which then each three of those can then bridge, bridge out and continue the, the dialogues. So hopefully the community aspect can then take some of those things and move forward. The school district can, can own some of the things that, that we're able to and then help to empower the kids at the high school to really bring that message and some of their work at the high school level. So the purpose of tonight is really to share this item with you that's coming out of the Goals Committee and open it up to the other committee members if they have any comment, but otherwise just looking for your endorsement to move ahead with the planning and the implementation of this meeting on December 5th. I guess I'd just like to add and reinforce uh, again the two-pronged nature of the dialogue both to give information and then to seek input from all these different stakeholders and I guess specifically working with the students you know it occurred to me later I tried to communicate to them as well it's not important what we think what really has an impact is what they're experiencing and there's really no substitute for what they're seeing and how it's affecting their lives and anything we can do to break down the walls of this is somebody else's problem, these are bad, badly parented kids, or th these are people we don't know. I, I mean, I, I think this is touching all of us now. Those personal stories are really, really important. And then the second piece is that it, it's not designed to be a one evening presentation and then be done. We're hoping we can help the dialogue and the information that gets shared is used to be a springboard so that then people come up with with actionable items from each one of these uh, groups. So what are the students interested in finding out more about on the topic? What, what, what supports do they think are working or not working or, or <coughs> how do we better engage with other people to do things that, that they think would, would work? And they don't have to have all the answers, but what they think is what really, really matters. So I'm, I'm hoping we can encourage lots of dialogue um, back and forth. It's, it's a really important topic that I think is touching all of us now. So, and I think if you look at the potential invitees, um, you know, to build on what Julie was saying, is sometimes just getting <coughs> people together to talk about this, pati this pati uh, a topic you know, within these three different frameworks maybe some new connections can be made that they didn't realize mm -hmm. um, they could, oh, I could work with you, oh, you're, you know, that kind of stuff then just is good for, for um, 
everyone involved. And it uh, doesn't mean we have to do anything other than provide a framework that enables that kind of dialogue and linkage, and, and then they can go off and do their thing. Some of it we do internally, and, but a lot of it happens um, from that point on with the other groups and individuals, which is um, part of what we consider our, our role to be as well. What, what kind of attendance would you guesstimate? I, I was really surprised. The student group, there, there were close to 20 kids in that room that, that, that came to the meeting. Yeah. So, and fairly well representative across the grade levels. I think we're hoping uh, at least to match similar numbers to what was there for the Amalia's Hope presentation, which was well over 100. Yeah, the Wanaki Cares Coalition, they've gained a number of interest in parties after that meeting. So where it used to be a group of a handful is now up 20, 30 people on their, mailing, on their email list. So I'm hoping that it'll gather. I would say if we hit 50 people, that would be great. Yeah. I yeah. think I mean, I like the topics, I like how it's laid out. I think um, keeping people to the timeline will be a real challenge. Right. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. Especially if you end up with 100 people. Um, so again, it's not really designed to come up with quick answers for now. I'm hoping no. we can just... Yeah. But I think it would be good to kind of set that stage, yep, yep. and this isn't the end of the discussion, this is the beginning of the discussion, so that people don't feel they have to say everything that's in their brain that night. Good point. Um, because I think that it's it looks so aggressive to me, and the amount of people in the timeline is like. <sighs> I think when we looked at the people, it was, it kept growing during yeah. our meeting as far as who else we were going to invite. And some of those are really duplicates when you look at the Wanaki Cares Coalition and their list. They've already got to have clinicians, et cetera, on their list. So there's some duplication of folks that are already would be attending. Um, but yeah, I think it's a matter of trying to say, put some connections together, put people together. They know where these groups exist now, where they, where they reside, and then we can figure out how they move forward. The kids right now at the high school, they're looking for a cause because they've been talking about it and they're looking for what's my actionable item, and that's what Ellen shared with us. So their hope is to figure out, well, what's something we can really get be proactive about versus being reactive to? And I think the, the CARES Coalition is saying, you know what, we, we now have some people that we're talking to. And I think making those connections is really important. So the, uh, I guess the outcome from, from my perspective is, is if we can broaden the conversation, they can continue to go out into the community, we see some things that can happen with each of these that really give a little bit more focus. I think we've done our job to really connect in on something that's really a concern around this table, and I think can then help to bridge out into the community as well. That's great. So is there an anticipation of concrete follow-up, not just in the community, but potentially within the district, within the framework of the district, I and mean, you know, whether it's uh, administrative at the high school, uh, whether it's uh, you know, transcending to all the schools, uh, is, is there an anticipation that this is more, this going to, people walk out of there tonight, they're going to say, I can see where this is going, or are they going to have more of a sense of, they're going to have more of a sense. I see Kurt nodding his head up and down. Is that because you're sleeping or? Are you no, 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 he was responding. He was responding. <laughs> I don't know if, the, if when they leave, they will know exactly what's going to happen. But what our hope is, is that they are giving us ideas of what they want. Okay. Parents, community, students. So then we can take that then as a group, working with the CARES Coalition and the students to offer those back, you know, if they want a, a parent training on a topic or a community forum on a topic, then we as the three groups can organize and put that on to, to give back to me. Because we want this to meet the needs of mm -hmm. what people think they need. And that's what the purpose of this is, is for us to have a clear vision of 
what parents would like, what students would like, what the community would like. And that's a terrific response. I think that's something the attendees need to hear up front. Sure. Correct. Yeah. To feel that they're giving something of value then and that they're not just giving it, but it's being attended mm -hmm. to. And I, and I, I wasn't questioning that it would happen, but that's yeah, what you've shared is a really big piece that yeah. will make that something more than a meeting. Mm -hmm. And that should actually, if possible, be articulated in whatever invitation. Yeah, result. that's what I just wrote yeah. down there. Oh, that's what I wrote. Outcomes. Yeah, or, yeah. or article that gets written in the paper helping us to know this. But, but maybe some of those goals even are what other questions did we not think of that mm -hmm. you'd like to have more information on? Right. And, and that is a goal. Yeah, that's what a goal. Okay, so um, <coughs> basically what the goals committee was looking for um, is that this is not necessarily a special board meeting without thinking, although it can be posted as a meeting where we have a note at the bottom that says a majority of board members may be present so that, you know, whatever the appropriate language is, so that it's not necessary to schedule a special meeting, but um, similar to how we've handled other such events, I think, at the high school and other topics. I, I, I like that approach. Because then you don't get into some of the some of the awkwardness of the motion to open and close it. We can just run it as at, it is a community linkage meeting yeah. that is being hosted by the board, and that if there's no decisions being made, we can post it accordingly by that. Um, so I, I guess all I'm looking for this evening is just a, I guess an endorsement from the board that just says that we should move ahead with um, this uh, as really our agenda for the fifth, so that we can get our invitations out from the next day. And um, start moving it forward with all of our planning. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Is it seconded? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll be moving ahead on that right away. So our school report. Um, Sheila Wired is here. She has um, her report in your packet. So I'll just turn it over to Sheila for a quick introductions, and then if there's um, any questions, you can direct them to Sheila for Summer School 2016. Good evening. Hopefully, hopefully you had a chance to look at it. It's a pretty simple one-sheet piece, and, and the good news is there. It was really a well-attended summer school, and we put in some efficiencies as well, which really boosted our FTE, which I think is an important piece. So I just kind of keep the data that I have, and I keep adding to it. Eight is not a special number, that's how long I had the data for you, and next year it will be nine years worth. Um, so our FTE went up to 167, which is a nice increase, and that's considering that we had one less day. One day of July 4th, or two depending when it will fall, really does affect summer school in the end, so even with one day less, that growth was really nice. Our enrollment continues to be good um, and strong. So going down below, kind of the two factors that were the biggest impact on jumping that FTE by 14, and that's considerable. Because for one FTE, it takes 48,600 minutes. That's a lot. Sounds like a cat song or something, I don't know. But um, by doing a new electronic sign-in, we always look for efficiencies with weightlifting um, or any program. We made the weightlifters much happier, our customers were happier, because they could do some things and get right to what they came to do instead of standing in a line. And then our elementary enrollment really increased. Um, so those are the two big heavy lifters on that FTE going up. Um, there's always new things, and I pared this down. Big um, uncollected funds decreased by 92.46%. And that was done through a tiered system of support, um, along with some fee structure changes and personal phone calls. So eventually we got those in. Um, we're in a consortium for summer school where we have shared cross uh, costs for programming and we also share ideas, which is great. There are several school districts that belong to that. Oregon hired a new programmer. We were on edge. Um, last time when I appeared before you in February, it was a pretty dicey time because we were about four months without a programmer and we knew we were going live April 1st. The, the really good news is there were about seven districts that were going live about one week before us. So. Um, they, got that, they got that person on board in full time instead of a consultant now. Um, another big surprise for us happened after summer school was already rolling. 
the Department of Public Instruction decided to change its reporting system, um, which is due in a very formalized report on September 15th. It wasn't changed for Wanakee, it was changed for the state. And a lot of it revolves around budget. So yes, they do want to know how much glue you use per project in arts and crafts. So I'd like to say kudos to Denise Melhoff as we work through this very difficult situation. Um, and we did well. Um, all the refunds were processed by our summer school office by October 1st. That's another new little piece that was a, oh, in there, got it done. In previous years, it would kind of take towards the end of the school year because of some of the hoops we needed to, to jump through, so that's really been streamlined. And then to give um, our high school interns or aides more of a real world experience, we created an online system for them instead of the old fashioned time card. So that was really a great thing to do, and it also really helped out principals. Um, we could track kids better. It helped out Greg Benz, who does some of the um, evaluations as well. So overall a good year and um, some of the challenges that we know we have for next year will revolve around the new DPI requirements in some of the ways that we either count programs in summer school or not so we're going to take a look at those and I'll have more information to give you regarding that when I come back to you in the winter because we're working through some of those as well but we anticipate another great year this next summer. Um, this next summer will also not have a shared elementary program. The past couple summers we've been in two buildings instead of all three, and now we'll be able to be in three, which is really nice for you know younger kids to be in their home base, and the intermediate school students will be able to be in the intermediate building, and I know that they enjoyed the high school while they were in there, but it's really nice to have your home base, and it really helps whatever grade level is transitioning in, elementary, new kindergartners, intermediate, new fifth graders, to experience the space and create that sense of comfort, getting to know the building is a big piece for them to feel comfortable when they start their school year. So questions for me on any of this? So you did a great job reducing your uh, uncollectibles by 92%. What was that, like uh, reduce $10, uh, $100, $10,000? Uh, so on reducing that number, we did, instead of the multi-mailings, I mean this mailing thing, and they got printed bills, and we did that a couple times, and we put, you know, second notice and third notice, and then I just decided to do some batch emails. So what's uh, the value? Is it what's the value of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the value? Yeah. In Thanks the first couple years, we would go with about 70000 we hadn't collected. Last year, I think we got that down to twenty, wow. over stepping through the years, and wow. so... Now it was just a few hundred dollars. It was amazing. <clears throat> but in the end, $20,000. I made phone calls. It was not fun, nor do I look at this as a side job that I would enjoy. But it does work when they have a person on the other end. And their child, need, they needed to pay their fees or they could not attend summer school. Yeah, I mean, I guess I presumed that's what we were But that doing. wasn't the issue. I mean, there were people who were obviously. So you can pay online, and we cannot, by law, create a shopping cart where you must pay prior to being enrolled because it would be discriminatory for anybody who could or would um, qualify for free or reduced. So we've worked on this with the Department of Public Instruction, and we're not allowed to do that because it seems pretty simple to me, just like you do any of your online shopping because right. people register online. Um, so they're allowed to register online and they may pay at the time, most do, or they can delay that and still be registered and that's where we run into this kind of bog down piece. So that answers your question. But that's just amazing that uh, $70,000 went uncollected. Is, is there a way to capture that in, in fees? So it, it didn't go uncollected forever. As Sheila mentioned, there was a first wave of bills, a second wave of bills. What she's referring to is by the time of the first day of summer school, there was a dramatic reduction in the number of continual requests to try to receive payment. So in the past, Denise Melhoff, who in this past summer did the majority of the collection prior to summer school was still continuing to do it 
throughout summer school and in some cases even a little beyond. So it's not that there was a large number of uncollected dollars that never came in. It's more of when they came in and how many attempts and contacts Sheila and her office had to do to obtain the dollars. It was an effort to move it to the front end, which is very difficult for your department in summer school to do, given how much you have going on at that time of the year. But after honing down the process, that was the uh, effort that really led to the dollars being collected up front. But it wasn't uncollected forever. It's just the timing of how long it took it to come in changed. You know, I always asked, what was the improvement on the remediation people? Okay. How many, how many remediation, yes. re remediation classes as opposed to enrichment? And do we have any better sense of to how well those students improved that were there yeah. for remediation? So I brought you my size four font. And the light's still good enough that I don't need readers because I did just in the past week or so decide I should break down and get some, but I'm doing okay. Um, first of all, our remedial numbers have dropped, and they've dropped at all levels. And part of that is because we do have RTI. When Janet was up here before and showed you that triangle, we have several interventions. So they have dropped, and they've dropped at every level, and those vary by percents. And then in terms of the success, for those that um, take remedial reading, take a remedial math, those types of pieces. At our K, and really it's grades one because it's exiting K, so our first graders through our eighth graders, they have standards that they need to meet, so it's very prescriptive. And then at the high school, it's also prescriptive. They have units that they need to complete in order to get their credits. Um, and so we're at a 96% success rate, which is really good. But know that our numbers have dropped as well, which you would hope that they would through RTI. Do we have a uh, keyboarding class? We do. We have had it. Um, Is it well attended? Or? Quite, quite a while. No, it's not. Um, and it's something that we've talked about. Do we need to expand it to the lower grade levels? So what we do is we have that at the intermediate, and it's keyboarding along with some fun, fun projects and programming because without that, our numbers seriously could have been four, five, six kids, and we try and bolster that up to at least 10 kids taking that class. Um, so Paul Miller has done that for a number of years and has done a nice job on that. We don't track data on the success of um, keyboarding, though, like how many words per minute improvement type of piece, but we do offer that. And we've talked about do we need to add that to our elementary because keyboarding is now in our third grade. I apologize if this is a too, too much of a detailed question, but when we talk about the remediation piece, do we track a student who, say, in grade one or two is reading below level, takes summer school, do we see how they do in the next year compared to kids who don't take that? Sure. And so can we... I mean, do we then see a, a success that shows the worthwhile? Extended. Yeah. Sure. Right. So what we do in reading in particular is our best data point. Right. Um, in our elementary and through intermediate, we have something called their BAS level, which is their fluency and comprehension. And we, had an, we have an end of the year mark, and we have a beginning of the year mark. So kind of measuring... Did summer maintain them? Did they slide? Did they grow? We haven't crunched those numbers individually yet, but we could do that. I guess my concern, interest is, if we know someone is reading below level, are we tracking that individual student to try to get them above level or closer to level, and do we see the effectiveness of the summer school program in helping them to Yeah. So the answer is those things are discussed when we have our universal meetings in the fall because you talk about each kid who might need an intervention or a booster group. Um, we don't have that same model in math, per se, um, to be able to compare an end of the year into a beginning of the year unless we took a look at their star, which is a little bit broader, um, their star data that we do. 
um, on the electronic time card, there was much discussion among several people in my house that more than two computers are necessary next year. Just to let you know. There were four at my building. Oh, well, it must it's have been probably a proportionate. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard for them to get their electronic time cards done in time for them to get to work. That was. We'll see if we can have a few a more. Major topic of complaint every week. A few more Chromebooks out there for them yeah. to sign in. Thank you. Thank you. Any announcements? Okay, on to committee reports. Um, starting with budget committee, it does not look like there's any action items, but the minutes are actually review. Okay, move on to curriculum committee. Thanks. Action. Well, in budget, there was with the salary increases in the wellness thing, I think, which was 3 0 by both, both votes are 3 0. Where that goes with here, that's different. Well, what we're going to be doing when we get to later on in the agenda is, um, is make taking action on some of that. I'm, plus, right. the eldest will be early. Just as a thing, okay. Okay. Curriculum committee. We have an extraordinary number of course proposals that Tim will give a brief overview if you wish to have it. Uh, the committee voted. 2 0 to, to uh, approve all and bring it to the board for board approval pending budgetary uh, ability to cover the courses. We had a summary memo plus the individual uh, new course applications in your packet. Uh, so I'm just going to go over these very lightly, and then if you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to uh, cover these. Um, some of these you've heard about before. Uh, so when um, Alyssa Band and Rhonda Knapp were in back in the spring, there were a few um, new ag courses they talked about. Those are uh, in the mix this year. Uh, we also, uh, as part of our Innovation Center piece, uh, shared with you there'd be some new course proposals coming through with uh, kind of the, uh, some of the curricular changes that we see coming with the Innovation Center. Uh, the first is this Fab Lab One course. It's probably going to be called Idea One. Uh, as uh, Jeff and Caleb have been talking about that, they wanted to come up with something that's a little more distinctive. And I think I noted that in the memo. Um, we also have uh, something that we mentioned uh, in the STEAM presentation uh, two months ago, which is um, the principles of uh, biomedical science. Uh, the Project Lead the Way biomedical course. It's a really good match for some of our kids, uh, in particular looking at health professions. Uh, we also have an advanced health course uh, that builds on uh, opportunities uh, above and beyond our quarter credit required health course. It's not a substitution for that. Um, and it also uh, does involve some career exploration in health areas. So we've, we've got a few courses that hit that. Um, another thing that's in here is um, as uh, the high school English team has looked at their scope and sequence, uh, they've looked at the American character and the American novel courses, uh, and they would like to um, sunset those two courses and bring in uh, an American literature course, which will in part draw on existing texts and the syllabi of the two courses, but kind of integrate them into a single offering. Uh, and so that's health, that's biomedical. I think I've covered all of them in a real high level view. Uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, potential ways to approach these fiscally, um, the, the English course really replaces existing courses, that's Annette. Uh, the other ones are in the elective areas. Um, we envision kind of in the overall high school staffing allocation, we may see some movement of FTE or movement uh, within content areas of instructor FTE, but we think the overall uh, FTE impact, when you look at the high school as a whole, uh, is going to be neutral. Now, there will be some implementation costs for these courses. Um, in terms of relatively small uh, supply line items, uh, we envision uh, dealing with those strictly on a reallocation basis uh, for some of our uh, you know, 
more startup costs like uh, some of the supplies for a project lead the way course like intro to biomedical science that's a more considerable cost so that would be something we'd address in uh, the CNI textbook budget. And that is the quick summary and you know certainly looking forward to any questions you have Dave. I'm guessing it's probably a typo but biotechnology applications and biotech applications are the same class because it's listed twice in the minutes there weren't two separate classes were there? No there should be well there's a biomedical intro to biomedical science and there's a biotech applications. Okay. So there's two. Yeah. So so let me right. I didn't talk about the biotech applications. So uh, biotech is a course we already have in our catalog at the high school. It is a concurrent enrollment course with Madison College, which uh, has some requirements. It's also because of some of the labs associated with that course one of the three semester length courses that in our program constitute the AP Biology sequence. So in some high schools AP Biology would be a full year course. In our program it's actually three one semester courses, AP Bio, Biotech, Anatomy and Physiology. Over the years uh, we've had students who are interested in getting more exposure to biotechnology uh, as a subject, but the AP labs and some of the other pieces that come along with the biotechnology course we currently offer haven't really been something they were interested in. So this is an attempt to kind of meet that interest with a different course. Okay, so basically the minutes of the curriculum probably, it has biotech applications and biotechnology applications, but doesn't mention the biomedical. Yeah, that's, that is so that's a, that's a typo. Different. I'll have to go back that's and fix that and reissue that. That's why my numbers come okay. I, I did express concern about that class in particular because it felt like it was a decrease in rigor of something we're already offering. And I always have concerns when we do that. Um, and I, we realize the length is long of these lists, but again, they're going to rise and fall and succeed based on their ability to attract students. So also shared the concern about the costs involved with um, different instructors will be putting in to uh, be paid to write the new curriculum. Mm -hmm. So there is an expectation that there will be some further sifting and winnowing based on our budget and ability to help assist with that curriculum writing. Correct. So. New course proposals always have first draw on the, the curriculum project allocations. I have uh, two, one comment, one question. Mm -hmm. um, in the American literature, um, there was like an added material textbook thing where the math didn't add. It's either a typo in it where it's like one or two at $12 equals $2,400 to $4,800. So I'm not sure what that was. So I'll just clarify. So uh, I think those are Brian's notes. And, and Brian just wanted to put a note on there that there, there could be a fiscal impact. I know okay, well when I've spoken with Walter, I know you Moore, go through. Okay. They, they still need to kind of, they're in the process of reviewing whether they need to purchase new texts or whether they really want to kind of look at the okay. texts we already have for the two courses that are sunsetting and really kind of remix those. Okay. Um, and then the other thing was um, I appreciate when you know, rather than just adding that there's also a, we're going to sunset some, I appreciate mm -hmm. when that yeah. information is shared too because, you know, yeah. it's like that's what you'd expect to have. Yeah, yeah. So appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. So um, there is a request for action to approve of all the new course additions um, as presented, right? Yes. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. There's a motion in the second to approve of the new course approval of new courses in, uh, as presented, assuming the funds are available. Um, any discussion, questions? Gary. I, I just got one. Um, mm -hmm. Are any of these addressing classes that people are going off to college that we end up paying for? In that, terms, that, that of, in terms of, of reducing our, our youth options or course, op course options exposure. Um, you know, I would say in, in looking at this list, None of these are uh, in and of themselves going to tackle 
a large number. I, I would say the ones that have probably had a bigger impact on that would be when we add like the AP government, um, you know, two years ago. Uh, but I, I would say that in some of these cases, um, in terms of maybe the food science or, um, you know, possibly the biomedical, we may be forestalling one or two kids that might apply for Madison College course. But, not so much. I mean, this is more, a lot of these are in the ag area. It's really a result of Alyssa coming in and working with Rhonda and coming up with some ideas to kind of broaden and, and revitalize. There's a possibility, Gary, because we get some of the ag kids from Middleton. Yeah, that's right. what I was wondering. Yeah. So, so we attract <coughs> them in. So that could attract some men, potentially, if we have room. Any other comments? Okay, the motion's on the table. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay, several items under the HR committee. Uh, first of all, I think there's um, uh, the October 19th, 2016 meeting minutes. There's a corrected copy and, at, in front of you, and uh, the only difference is that we wanted to make sure all the names were correctly presented on uh, in terms of who was present at that negotiations meeting. Um, the item underneath that is an item which was actually discussed and approved at the committee level at our October 7th meeting, 3-0, but it didn't appear as an action item at the full board level, and that's the Community Ed Aquatics Supervisor position. There's information in, in your packet on that. So I guess, uh, are there questions on the information that was presented for that um, additional individual for, to provide support to Christy Acker? It did pass 3-0 at our HR meeting, so if there are no questions, is there a motion to approve of the request at the full board level? Motion to approve the request for the aquatic supervisor job. Second. Moved and seconded. Questions? I guess I just would say it's just knowing from past experience, it's probably a really good idea because those t keys sometimes had a way of getting tossed from life or to lifeguard and having less than consistent protocols and safety measures. And so I think it's definitely something we need to do. Christy's only one person. She's very dedicated. She works really hard, but she needs, she you needs know, every, everybody. <laughs> It's a fever every now and then or something. And there's also a lot of demand for that particular That's right. Facility. That's right. Uh, and you will also see that uh, uh, paid through Fund 80, so it doesn't affect any of our yep. other programs. Okay, all in favor of the recommendation, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, the November 8th meeting minutes. Um, the first item is considering the language for payout of points at retirement. Um, I think this has been discussed. Uh, Randy, it's a Yeah, I think um, this was actually brought forward at a, at a previous meeting, probably this summer, early summer. And we had, there was a desire to at that point look at two different options for the payout of bank points at retirement. One um, through um, a, a piece with WRS and the other one through an HRA um, option as we've um, vetted that out through um, just further research and working with our, our, our staff committee, and um, we're recommending tonight um, to stay with um, option one, which is the one that ties those um, points payouts to the HRA option. Is there a motion to approve of that language? Motion to approve. Second. Move and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, so this point stuff, it did end up going to that points committee and the employee groups were fine with option one. Yes. Yeah, Joan, you were part of that committee, right? Yeah, I missed the meeting. Oh, okay, well, I missed, yeah, <laughs> but I missed the meeting. <laughs> well, we, well, we heard... Uh, Are you yeah. fine? Is that Joan? It is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's okay, uh, so any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, item B, um, you will see in your packet there was a tentative agreement for a 0.12 base wage increase for the teachers. That's what we um, are allowed to um, negotiate. So that's the highest level the we're highest allowed, level to we're allowed to negotiate. But there's more coming in the next item. So, right. um, 
but we do need to take action on that tentative agreement with the WTA for 2016-17. Is there a motion to approve of that tentative agreement for this wage increase? So moved. Second. Really seconded by Joan. Any comments? Just that it would be nice if someday the state decided to set, step out of that and let a local board actually handle their dealings with their whole budget instead of being tied in one area. Hey, but that was just a comment. <laughs> All in favor of that, right? <laughs> okay, any other comments? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 2016-17 uh, compensation for all employee groups. Um, did you want to uh, present that, Steve? I mean, uh, the information has been presented to both the Budget Committee and PASS 3O and HR 3O. So, yeah. Randy? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we gave a preview to at a, at a previous meeting when we were going through all the budget work in the last month. And as Peggy said, the HR Committee's had a chance to review it as, as has the Budget Committee. This includes the supplemental pay for our, our teachers, so that's what we call our points system. That fifteen hundred dollars, and that's a two percent increase for our non all of our other employee groups. This also includes the um, aspects of the second phase of our QTI study for administrative assistance, the averaging aspect for our admin staff, um, an adjustment to two of our tech positions per some Fair Labor and Standards Act adjustments, and then setting aside thirty to forty thousand dollars that would be for um, future pay um, at the board at, at the board's discretion. Um, regarding the next level of the QTI study for our um, um, other employee groups that we're studying this year. Is there a motion to approve all of that approve. package? Second. Jack seconded by John. Further discussion? I just uh, thank you to Steve for providing the info that we requested at the last board meeting so we could see some of the longitudinal uh, data from previous years. Much appreciated. Did you have a comment, Yeah, I, when I was looking at the total dollar increase per <coughs> thing, I, was just, I just found it a little ironic that the two lowest groups were the ones we're doing a QTI study on to get them on, caught up on catch-up pay. I just thought that was kind of humorous in a weird way. Um, but I guess since we're going to be addressing that, when are we expecting that that study to come around? I would ask Connie to weigh in on that. <coughs> Connie's working I, with them on it. I looked at you only because you're yep, No, that's okay. <laughs> you're so close. And you always say that I have good questions. <laughs> <laughs> we're expecting um, initial results back from the QTI study in January with hopefully recommendations in February. Okay. And that's for which group again? This is for the QTI group, the classified staff that the study is underway right now. And so that's what you're asking about, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any other questions? So just for clarification, is it 30 to 40 sort of a balancing all based upon the expected for adding to it based on the report? I think it's because we didn't really have anything set aside when we did the first one, and we want to have something set aside to account for <coughs> possibly what. This brings us, go ahead. Go, Steve. Yeah, we, the range is just indicated as uh, discretion for the board when the report comes back. And we did talk in the budget committee that, you know, the board would not necessarily be limited to that. We could certainly look at other options given the results of the study. Uh, one of the comments we heard uh, previously was when we had a QTI study ongoing, we did not have funds set aside for later in that fiscal year when the results come back. Uh, we did talk about this topic in the committees and indicated that you know, the scope of what we expect to come back certainly cannot be managed by that dollar amount, but it is a dollar amount that as a board, if there are high priorities, let's say in this example, we see the electrician is significantly off or maybe others, the board could prioritize some action yet this fiscal year to be taken to close the gaps for those areas that are of greatest need. And then I would 
um, basically, I'm going to ask for approval or uh, not, and then we have two that will need to abstain from this. Because we have spouses that are employed. Any other discussion on the compensation package? Proposal? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Sorry. Did you hear your call? <laughs> no, I did not. There's a ventriloquist over there. Okay, motion's carried. Thank you. Policy committee. Policy committee, Matt, there was really um, the piece that's in front of you tonight is really just wanting to um, have the board's endorsement of conversation we had with regards to the Warrior Stadium donor recognition. And one of the things we want to be able to provide that community group is what are they able to um, talk to their donors about as far as recognition. Um, scoreboard is already within our policy to do that. We also have past experience with um, pavers, um, like um, landscape pavers and donor walls. We also have um, experience with things that have been associated with our light poles, such as the baseball field. And the committee also discussed that signage along a fence would be amenable um, depending on how that looked. But discussion with regards to anything on a like a main entryway or with regards to actual advertising on the field itself was not something the committee was interested in at this time. So I just wanted to, in fairness to that community committee, wanted to really have that brought forward here so that we're comfortable specifically with kind of those as their parameters. And then obviously anything that they would do, they would bring back bring back in a visual depiction so that you can see what it looks like before it actually gets takes place. So it's not we're looking for action or anything, but just feedback or bond. Yeah, I just want to see, make sure that we're on the same page and that if those are coming forward that we generally have um, are comfortable with that, that being explored. It was more the permanence of some of those other things that was and what I would see is just like with things like at the baseball field, when those um, actual designs or pieces came forward, those would come back through like the facility committee. But I, I don't, I just, this is generally what um, the committee was comfortable with, giving them as parameters, and then we'll bring that back as, as those start to get designed out. But wanted to make sure that the full board was aware of that, as in the advertising, et cetera, from that community group was, was, was brought forward. Any questions on that? So, so just to be clear, I was there. Um, if in the end, any signage or any advertising, we would still have to specifically look at, just so it's like Miller Lite high school football team <laughs> would not yeah. be a great not a idea. Yeah. Right. So, you'll, you'll get to be able to see kind of, if, if you're looking at things along a fence, you'll be able to see kind of what that looks like. I think that was, um, that was brought up is that you were comfortable with something along there as long as it was um, done tasteful. Okay, there was another item on the agenda, on, on the uh, uh, policy committee meeting that we just discussed, there was use of facility regulations. Yeah, one of the things that um, Aaron May and I brought forward was this, um, wanting to discuss with the committee the use of facilities. Um, we've had this, um, as he's had some experience now um, working through implementation of that policy, there's some things that we felt that we need to bring forward with regards to just um, some clarification and growing number of, of groups that use our facilities that we think we can improve upon. We also had discussion just with regards to use of the pool um, and some of the aspects related to that. Um, so the committee has asked us to, to further investigate the, um, those issues and bring back um, a draft policy for the committee to review in the future. Um, Aaron is looking at also some of the fee structures with regards to that because those have not been reviewed in, in uh, a few years and we're looking to actually break those pieces out and when Steve brings forward as part of the, the budget process it, every spring we'll bring the, you know, the rental fees that we want to be charging so that we can uh, review those on an annual basis. I think that's just a, that, that was a good catch as we discussed that policy. I feel we have no recommendation here this evening that that will be coming um, probably in the next month or two. Okay, 
Goals Committee, I think we've discussed and taken action to approve the, the meeting. Any other comments from the Goals Committee? Uh, no, I hope you all can make it December 5th. Put a big gold star on your calendar. And okay, on to consent agenda. Um, consent agenda has checks, uh, monthly finance reports, including the district census report, uh, a request to purchase a maintenance truck, give some field trips, and the staff changes. Uh, the updated one was in front of us at our spots today. Um, as always, you can have a motion to approve the entire consent agenda as presented um, or pull something up for separate consideration. Motion to approve the entire consent agenda. Second. Just a quick question on the uh, Ford truck that you're uh, purchasing. What, what is, he's paying $47,000 for that? Purchase the truck he stated he's looking for for a cost of forty seven. dollars that It does include everything that would go with it, including the plow, the box in the back. Uh, so it's a, there is a vehicle, if you look at the bottom yeah. of the picture, that's exactly, that's last year's model of what they are requesting to purchase in the maintenance department. There were bids completed. Um, the staff themselves prefer the purchase through the Middleton Ford. It is not the lowest bid but is the recommendation from the staff in that department to have consistent equipment and to try to go with a common line. Um, so the staff are recommending the Ford, but as I noted in the minutes, I mean, we do have bids as required by board policy. <coughs> the Ford is not the low bid of the choices, but it is the request of the staff uh, to go with that purchase. Have we been happy with the performance of our past boards? The maintenance staff who use them have been, and they prefer those trucks over okay. the others. But um, as a part of our process, we do go out and seek bids to compare it. Um, this year, the Ford was more expensive, but for a desire to maintain consistency, uh, that is the request that you're seeing tonight. Is that also, you know, because they need to work with the same dealer for other follow-up yeah. you know, maintenance and repairs? Use it as a lever to renegotiate with Ford. Uh, that's a good question. Um, we you know certainly, I mean? yeah, yeah it's, it, the the cost of that particular vehicle increased quite a bit from last year to this year because of a complete redesign. Um, so the cost actually went up quite a bit from the year before, uh, and actually costs more than the Dodge now. Um, the hope would be that that was the major price increase was this year and that it'd be more competitive in the future. Um, if we continue to see this type of difference, it may be worth exploring. But in the past, the Ford was the lowest price bid. Um, just this year, it didn't come in that way. <coughs> I heard to tell them that. Yep. We prefer you. Yep. You've always been lower. Can you work with us? Yep. Any other comments? Questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda approved. Um, board business, uh, as a reminder, the convention is coming up for those of you who, I think we all get the school news. Um, basically, in the um, tw November 2016 issue is gives you a highlight of the kinds of presentations, information on registration. If you want to go to the, uh, to the conference, you will register through Rebecca. And just as a reminder, early registration, which has some discounted prices, is Friday, December 9th, the state conference. But all the information, you know, if you're ever interested in getting into it, is in this most recent school news. Um, Application. So, so the ones to there for three. It's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 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 Right, right. 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 Convention You're stuff is Tuesday kind of afternoon. Yeah. Those yeah. Opening <laughs> workshops are Tuesday afternoon, and then it closes Friday at noon. Okay. So, uh, any legislative updates? Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I talk about that. Just, just sit there and say it's. Um, okay, uh, any future me agendas and meetings? Um, I think we're well, with uh, Thanksgiving coming up in a week, and we have then the linkage meeting to plan for for the 5th. I don't see any, do you have anything, Steve, that you need? 
I think we have an HR meeting scheduled already for the budget committee in between. Sorry, were there other meetings? Steve said he needed a budget. Okay. Yes, and it's likely that we would need to set aside at least two hours. So I'm not yep. sure sure yeah. we have enough yeah. time mm -hmm. to, uh, to cover all of the various So when topics. you want to do it? So Anywhere before? Ideally, it would be before the December board meeting because there's likely going to be pieces that would come to the board meeting. So either the week of the 28th or the week of the 5th would be ideal. About the week of the 5th, Steve. Well, I guess I can't get it. Are you looking at morning or are we looking at evening? Whatever the committee prefers. I'm most flexible, so. If you're looking at Joel's morning's okay, okay anymore? Um, morning uh, is okay uh, with uh, me. If Something like 8 o'clock on a whatever, 8 to 10? So you could take the HR committee's time on December 6th. Well, that hey, all right. Yeah, 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 let's do that. Awesome. Awesome. There I have you are. That all out. That's great. Right. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you, Connie. Love to have It's overtime, probably. From 8 to 10. That's worked out nice. You're welcome to come, Connie, if you really <laughs> wanted to go to a meeting. That's all we need. Okay, and then as I just want to make a comment. Let's see, apparently there's some goodies over there for anybody who's here remaining in the room here <laughs> from uh, Findorf. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's in there, but it's cookies. Good looking cookies. Good looking cookies. So everybody who's here, including our videographers, if you want to take some treats before you leave. It, there's a curriculum one scheduled already previously for the 30th as well. So. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Motion to second. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> What's the date to go to that committee? What's the one? I think it's on the agenda. Oh, it's 18th and the 20th, yeah. but what's, I should look at the agenda and see what I want to see. Is that what it is? Or is there stuff to go? i got to be in the legislative committee. Yeah, right? If you don't have the awesome. magazine you should talk about, I'll have a copy just down there. Yeah, I'll take that. They were all fine with all I'll have to figure that out. And you're going to ask things. Are you staying? Yeah, I'll be staying. 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 Yeah